I'm calling to order this hearing. This is a public hearing of the Committee of the Whole of the Council of the District of Columbia. It is an oversight hearing. I'm Phil Mendelson, Chair of the Council and Chair of the Committee of the Whole. Today is Thursday, January 18th, 2024. The time is 12.01 in the afternoon. And this hearing is being held, well, some of us are live and in person in room 412 of the Johnny Wilson Building. But I believe many of the witnesses will be testifying virtually via the Zoom video conference broadcast platform. This hearing is available. I think it is, I don't know if it's being um, broadcast live, but it will be available on the council's website, www.dccouncil.gov. The subject of this hearing, oversight hearing is the district's housing code inspection process, broken and in need of repair. One of the core functions of the Department of Buildings is to inspect rental housing properties for compliance with the district's property maintenance code. A code which is meant to ensure that structures and units are habitable and safe. Each year, the department inspects thousands of units based on tenant complaints or for the purpose of a proactive inspection. The committee has long heard complaints from tenants, advocates, and legal service providers that the inspection process and the outcomes that result from these inspections are flawed and fail to adequately protect tenants. The committee has spent the last several months analyzing data on complaints and inspections conducted at over 50 properties across the district, as well as looking at the standard operating procedures, training manuals, and other relevant information. And the committee staff has prepared a report that contains a list of findings and recommendations. Uh, the report was released, I believe, earlier this week. Uh, it's posted on the council's website, no, on the Committee of the Whole's website, on the Committee of the Whole's website, which is accessible through the council's website. The purpose of this oversight hearing is to hear from the public and government witnesses about the findings and recommendations of the report as well as other ways to improve the rental housing inspection process. Uh, we have a number of witnesses, something like 26 who registered to testify, but anyone is invited to submit comments. For the record, the record will be open for two weeks. That is the record will close at 5 p.m. on Thursday, February 1st, 2024. The uh, committee has hearings from time to time regarding the Department of Buildings. We have performance oversight hearings, usually in February or early March, and we will have such a hearing in a month. Uh, we have hearings at other times of the year, and we receive a lot of complaints with regard to the inspections and uh, enforcement or follow-up with regard to those inspections. Uh, so what we did was uh, committee staff, Blaine Stum, uh, looked more specifically at 50 properties and different steps of the inspection process, including the hiring and training onboarding of inspectors uh, to see where things are going well and where there could be some improvement. All that is embodied in this report that, as I said, is posted on the committee's website and the public's invited to look at it. And um, this hearing is uh, in furtherance of that effort. So uh, I'll call the witnesses in a moment, but I'm gonna recognize a colleague, Councilmember Robert White, if you have an opening statement. Uh, thank you, Chairman, uh, for holding this hearing and to, to you and the committee for this report uh, on the Department of Building Housing Code Inspection Process. Um, and, and really for launching a much needed investigation into this. As noted in the committee report, the Committee of the Whole began this investigation due to repeated complaints demonstrating that the current process is ineffective. Ineffective doesn't begin to describe what we are seeing. The, many have watched us uh, at their, watched as their units and their buildings have deteriorated around them despite making repeated complaints to DOB. In several instances, the situation declines to the point where tenants beg for their buildings to be placed in receivership. On a walkthrough of one such building, I noticed holes in the walls, water-soaked carpeting, a garage that had clear, frequent flooding, wires hanging from the ceiling, and broken handrails on the stairs, and this was just in the common areas. 
I can only imagine what tenants are seeing in their units. Tenants should expect and do expect to pay rent and receive in return safe, healthy, and well-maintained housing. They should expect when this arrangement fails for their government to hold property owners accountable to this standard. It is clear from the regu regular outreach my office received from residents that some landlords are failing their tenants and the district is failing to hold them accountable. I'm grateful uh, to Chairman Mendelson and his staff uh, for taking a hard look at this and drafting recommendations for DOB to consider. I know there are many residents who are frustrated with me, with the council, with the mayor, because they have not seen the progress they want to see. Uh, I'm frustrated as well. And I wish I had the answer today that would solve the issues. Uh, we have to work through the process. We have to try to fix what's broken. Uh, there is no magic bullet here. If there was, I would have fired that a long time ago. So we're gonna work through it. You can continue to be frustrated with me. I'm gonna continue to be frustrated until this gets fixed as well. Uh, so Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Lewis George, if you are here virtually, do you want? Do you have a statement? Yes, Chairman. Thank you, I do. Um, thank you, Chairman, um, and thank you to your staff for holding this important oversight hearing. Um, I will keep my rocks brief since I will be in and out of the hearing, but I'm looking forward to hearing from the public witnesses and speaking more with the government witnesses about Department of Buildings inspection process and communication with tenants. Having a strong inspection and enforcement system with safeguards is how we protect tenants in DC from living in dangerous, undignified housing. And while we know there has been some progress in D Department of Buildings communications, responsiveness and transparency, um, which we truly appreciate. This hearing is about drilling down on some of the continued issues with our system, especially uh, ensuring there is follow-up and accountability after an infraction is identified. When a tenant reaches out to DOB to report a violation, they need the agency to stick beside them um, uh, from the initial inspection until the issue is invaded. Um, in Ward 4, our tenants um, have had a number of issues um, and so today is going to be about talking through some of those issues to highlight some of the systemic issues and the ways that we can improve them. I hope that with this committee's thorough report and DOB's responsive and willingness to accept many of the committee's recommendations, um, district residents will get some relief um, and feel uh, safer um, at home. So thank you, Chairman. Um, and I look forward to uh, talk, hearing from our public witnesses, but specifically talking to our government witnesses today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilmember. Uh, so with that, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call witnesses in three groups. We have 26. Um, so um, Eleni Christidis, who is Supervising Attorney with Legal Aid DC, Ivan Hall, who is Public Witness, uh, Ashley Ruff, Rhonda Hamilton, who is President of Healthy DC and Me Leadership Coalition, Barbara Cooper, Janine Evans, Tanisha Gordon, Cornelia Hill. So I'm doing eight at a time. Didn't think about whether I have eight seats there. How many folks are here in person? Guess what? We have exactly four seats for four people. Uh, so the first witness who I'm assuming is online is Alini Christidis. Why don't you proceed? Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Mendelson, council members and staff. My name is Eleni Christidis. I'm a Ward 1 resident and supervising attorney in the Housing Law Unit at Legal Aid DC. Legal Aid provides free legal services to low-income district residents, and our housing practice works to preserve stable, affordable, and healthy housing for DC renters. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this hearing and thank you for the committee's work in investigating DOB's current housing code inspection process and recommending ways to improve it. Legal Aid supports the committee's recommendations and we hope DOB will fully implement them. My written testimony discusses some of the committee's recommendations in more detail. Today, I will touch on two recommendations and suggest that DOB can better involve tenants at every stage of the housing code enforcement process. First, we support DOB including more prominent language about deferred enforcement in its notices to landlords. It could be helpful if this information came in the form of a flyer or one pager in the mailing containing the notice of infraction. It could also come with the nudge letter suggested by the committee. 
we suggest this one pager contain guidance about how to correctly abate the most commonly cited violations or violations that DOB finds are often repaired incorrectly. For example, landlords will often seal rodent holes with steel wool or spray foam that can be chewed through by rodents. And we've heard DOB does not consider this an adequate repair. The flyer on deferred enforcement could contain guidance that spray foam or steel wool is not acceptable for sealing rodent holes, ensuring that landlords who elect deferred enforcement know how to properly abate the violation. Second, we strongly support the committee's recommendation for in-person verification of abatement. We agree that photos or other documents can be misleading. They can show the wrong area, be taken from too far away, or just not be enough to determine whether an appliance, like a refrigerator, stove, dishwasher, or garbage disposal is working properly. Without in-person verification, DOB's enforcement is essentially on the honor system and therefore not effective at ensuring healthier or improved living conditions for tenants. We urge the committee and DOB to keep tenants at the focus of their reform efforts. Tenants are the people personally affected by housing code violations. The report suggests that DOB has no consistent method of notifying tenants about the results of an inspection or any subsequent enforcement steps. In an age where you can track a package, food delivery, or rideshare vehicle in real time, it is unacceptable that a tenant not have an equally easy way of tracking the status of their complaint with DOB. Letting tenants know that their landlord has elected deferred enforcement or that the NOI associated with their complaint has been filed with OAH should be standard practice. It gives tenants an opportunity to dispute a landlord's claim of, claim of abatement, equips DOB with useful current information, and sends a message that DOB is pursuing enforcement even if the tenant is not seeing immediate results. If DOB wants to refashion its image and credibility with tenants, it must devise systems to keep tenants informed and engaged at every step of the enforcement process. Thank you for the chance to provide this testimony. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Ivan Hall, I don't believe is here. Ashley Ruff. Um, Rhonda Hamilton. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the council. Thank you very much for hosting this hearing um, to discuss the DOB housing violations uh, process um, and the failure of the process. I'm disappointed to report that in February 2023, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we were down here to advocate on behalf of the tenants to represent some of what your report has found. And while we are excited to see the findings and the recommendations for change, we can't help but to feel that this is reactionary behavior. And many of the tenants that have been living with egregious uh, uh, conditions in the city are very concerned when we come down to advocate for these matters time and time again to explore the uh, proper fixes for the DOB system would be to understand that DOB uh, is not providing written receipts for uh, matters that they're finding that have to be uh, Find what they're not also doing is helping the tenants to understand the enormity of what this particular landlord has already amassed in outstanding violations, thus uh, entering into the slumlord understanding behaviors. Yourself, Mr. White, being the housing chair, uh, uh, chairperson um, has mentioned on many occasions that you stand with the tenants, but these are just words for them. They are living through egregious condition, as you know, Healthy DC is uh, mental health outreach advocates, and we're concerned that we're continuing to have these reactionary conversations and hearings and not really addressing root cause understandings. Mental health exposures and traumatic understandings happen when you have rats and you have to live with their feces, when you're living with mold and things of that nature, asbestos and things that are not being properly abated. The OAG um, has not, in the tenant's understanding, been a very uh, valid source for justice. We have a social justice division, but many of these tenants are not seeing justice. You yourself promised that they would be allowed to have a public meeting with the attorney, uh, the attorney general's office. And you, Mr. White, mentioned that you were not that well-versed on TOPA. Well, how would these tenants of the district feel uh, comfortable with your leadership and oversight in these matters when you are not keeping your word to them. Today, Healthy DC is here testifying and we've uh, brought tenant representations from five communities across the district representing Marbury Plaza, 
Woodbury Village, which you guys are very familiar with, uh, 760 Chesapeake Street Southeast, um, uh, goodness, Nash Place, and also, um, uh, I'm sorry, Wingate. And so what I would ask the council and the uh, listening public to understand is that while these reports are hopefully going to be helpful, we're concerned with the reactionary measures that have these tenants continuing to be exposed to mental health understandings and systems that continue to fail them. And we do believe that the problems in this housing circumstances are directly connected with the failures of public safety. They can't live in uh, environments that uh, have them frustrated and surviving and not go out and behave or uh, have outputs and other negative uh, manners. So we would beg the council uh, to reconsider promises made to these tenants and to uh, deliver. And we would ask Mr. Robert White to strongly consider the amendments presented to you for the changes to the Title 14 housing that would directly address tenants living with egregious housing conditions. Thank you for this opportunity today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hamilton. Um, Ms. Cooper. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ms. Cooper. I'm the president of Marbury Plaza Tenant United. Um, I'm very disappointed in DC Council too and DOB. Um, we should have had uh, um, inspection and I, on our property, that means each and every one of the units, instead of DOB telling Ms. Cooper to go knock on doors and see what tenants need to be done in their apartments. That's not my job. And also, I was very disappointed that no one stepped in when it was time, when they found out that we were sending in all the paperwork um, to DOB about the unhealthy living conditions that we got, that they didn't follow up. They did not come back out, they did not inspect or none of that. If you don't have oversight on what's going on on the property, they can come out and, and do the fine or, or look at it, but who is watching them to make sure their job is right? Everything can come on computers. Some people needed to be brought into the mail. Everybody's not computerized. My next um, issue I had was DOB. I mean, I'm sorry, OAG. How they um, backstabbed us, going behind our backs, making deals um, about Marbury Plaza. First of all, you don't do that. You know, I, I understand you don't work for us, but the people of the city makes the city. Without us, y'all don't have a job. And if y'all can't do right by us, what make y'all think that we're going to do right by y'all? I'm very disappointed. The system that y'all have now, it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. If you don't have oversight on what's going on, the elderly living in the building, you know, afraid or can't get out because they don't have the proper assets to get out of the buildings, scared the building gonna catch a fire. You know, what's, what's that all about? They don't even have a ramp in the back building. And my other issue I have is with Mr. Robert White. It's this green, what is this? This DC green new leaf deal. Marble Plaza didn't come down here for that. We didn't come down here for social housing. We don't want social housing. We had stop our slum lords come with us to be a part of helping us get what we wanted. So they um, hijacked out, you know, our, our little rally and put in um, social housing. You and seven others signed the position. I saw it with my own eyes. None of y'all have the right to do that because none of y'all live there and y'all don't know the conditions that we live in. I seen y'all had meetings about the, this uh, uh, social housing or green leaf deal. I didn't see not one black person in that room and I'm not prejudiced, but it is what it is and I'm gonna call it like I see it. You cannot do that. 
And right now, I feel as though all of y'all, all of y'all are failing us. But then y'all want us to vote y'all in. My baby get up this morning. We don't have hot water. This morning. Right now, as we speak. But we back paying full rent. We back paying full rent because of bankruptcy. Because you all were so selfish that didn't want to help us that the landlord get to do what he want to do. Everything is designed for the landlord to win. Why? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. Uh, Janine Evans. You're good. Good afternoon, my name is Janine Evans. I am a resident of Wingate. <clears throat> Um, we have other issues, but there are three in particular that I feel that we need to um, fix and immediately. Our security is a major concern and a need for the residents on this pro on our property. When I say security, I'm speaking about the officers, surveillance cameras, and the lighting in the parking lots. As of now, the company we have is P Change. There are some that attempt or do their job, but the rest of them are there to collect the check. On July 31st at 10, 11 p.m., a few officers were recorded smoking with residents on the seaside parking lot. I'm the one that recorded it. Um, they were smoking in the parking lot with residents. We can't have that. If we are going to have a sign that states 100% ID check, then that's what needs to happen. More times than not, you walk inside the building, officers at the desk won't even put their, bring their head up to look at you because they're on their phones. So people are just walking in and out. We shouldn't have that either. <clears throat> they don't walk the floors like they should. And if they do, that's because something has already happened nine times out of 10. So rounds need to be made in the building and that's not happening some of the officers are very unprofessional i stood in the lobby and officers were talking they're cussing uh making derogatory comments they never even stopped because i was standing there they kept going that's not professional um i've seen officers go back and forth with residents cussing, ready to fight. I mean, literally, other officers had to hold them back because they're about to fight. So how is that, you know, helping us? Might as well be a resident here. That's not, that's not acceptable. We need cameras. I suggest that we have cameras in all the elevators. We need to have one on every floor in the elevator, on, in front of the elevator when you come up to, onto the floor, and one on each end. Um, because as of now, we have people still in packages. You can't even get your own package. I shouldn't have to send my package somewhere else to get it. Or if I am home, I have to constantly watch my door and look out the people to see if my, my package got there. I shouldn't have to do that. No one should have to do that. If I order something or something is coming for me, if I'm not home, it should be at my door when I get there, no matter the time or day. It should be there because it's mine. <clears throat> we have people with pets. They, they let them urinate and defecate in the hallways. They don't clean it up. Uh, in the elevators, even we saw recently a woman, she peed in the hallway. Like literally peed in the hallway and was just fine. That's not acceptable either. But if we had cameras, these people can be held accountable. They can be held accountable. And we don't have that. Um, maintenance is another issue. We have over 650 apartments combined. And we only have five maintenance men. 
How is that even possible? It's 350 of them in my building. And we have three sides. There's only three of them working in the building that I'm in. And then the other 329 are in the back. There's only two over there. I suggest that we need to have some maintenance that live on the property so they can handle emergency calls in the middle of the night instead of waiting for the one maintenance man that lives all the way in Woodbridge, Virginia. I've, I've experienced it. You got to wait. I had to call out from work because I had to wait for them to come to handle my issue in my bathroom. The issue that took forever to get fixed, which was feces coming up in my bathtub, I'm on the top floor. Come to find out the pipes have lead in it and they built it too high. So it backs up. Um, Ms. Evans, I've let you go over your time, but you're two minutes over. So okay. um, thank you. Tanisha Gordon. Good morning, everybody. And thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule to hear from us today. As a community member and president at Wingate Apartments and the Garden Apartments. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule to hear from us today. As a community member and recent president at Wingate Garden Apartments and tenant since 2016, I've seen different management, office management and security um, detail changes along the way. During this time, there were many inconsistencies in how the property was managed. While new management came in, there wasn't much difference in how the property was operated. Um, however, the assumption is from our management is that people are just being irresponsible by not paying their rent. But on the flip side, we're also told that this is why they aren't equipped to fix the things on our property and why these things aren't truly being fixed. However, after going over OTA's tenant bill of rights, which is something that each property management should be handed to each new tenant, which I've also confirmed they have not. Um, line six states that a landlord must ensure that your unit and all common areas are safe and sanitary as the first day of tenancy known as warranty of habitability. This covers my dwelling, and again, all common areas, safe, secure, free of rodents and pests, while keeping the structure and facilities in good, good repair to ensure adequate heat, lighting, and ventilation. Line number eight covers written notice of mold or suspected mold in the unit and common areas, which has been reported between both the towers and garden apartments. In the later part of September 2023, Department of Buildings found 14 violations inside of building 74, 76, which are connected through the ground level. Um, due to due to those conditions, they were CIH was fined over ten thousand dollars as of January seventh. That was Sunday, twenty twenty four. There's still water in the ground floor. There's still the beeping sound that was reported in the summer, um, and the the wall of black mold was just painted over. They had a wet floor sign down there where you could just step up from the from the door doorway to the stair, but there's standing water there still even with DOB coming out and doing an inspection report and finding the property. So I do question their follow-up processes and some of the, the different codes and things um, and their grading standards. And in addition to her issue, she had a plumber come into her apartment, the 10003 in the towers back on December 15, 2022 at 11, at 11.59 AM, where they confirmed that they, they're still lead, lead pipes present on the Wingate property, which was the issue why she had feces backing up into her tub from the 10th floor. Um, and October to November, 2023, we had a, um, just a regular plumbing inspection done where they just came in and they just checked, and checked our sinks and maybe changed around the, the knobs around our toilets, but that was it. There was a re re no real reason. I even talked to the guy who came in who said he was just there doing that for documentation purposes, which is fine. Um, and then despite putting poison in the walls, there's still rodents running behind walls and in the ceilings on both properties. There is a rodent, there's rodent and roach droppings all over many places throughout. I've taken photo, I've photographed dead rodents in the park outside and recently on the ground floor level in our basement. Lastly, the recent videos and pictures in various areas inside the towers of water dripping from the water shaft on the ground floor, baseboard floor, on my floor, the ninth floor, and there was water leaking from the ceiling on the seventh floor where our maintenance guy just placed the overfill trash can underneath to catch the water. 
all of which are issues that seem to be underlying and, and or and ongoing issues never fully uncovered or addressed. And especially with DOB getting involved, you know, I've heard things like, long as it passes what it is, okay. That's not okay for our tenants. Mm -hmm. For an inspector to come in to tell me what's passing or not passing, in addition to the fact that I've had elevator shutdown um, and us being told that long as one elevator is working, it's fine. That's not fine for the floor that I, for the building that I live in that services 10 floors. It's not okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gordon. Uh, Cornelia Hill, if she's here. Don't see her. Yes, I have it. I have a statement from each of you, so thank you for that. Um, so we'll have a, one round of, um, we'll try five minutes with questions. Um, Ms. Gordon, Ms. Evans, you're both from the same housing complex. And uh, I was going to ask, so w why is this maintenance person coming from Woodbridge? Just because that's just what it is? And they don't have any of the other five, none of them live closer. Um, and then um, do the three who work with the 350 apartments, do they ever go and work with the other, which is 329 apartments and vice versa? But it's, they're five, but there aren't five. They're three and they're two. So five minutes. But again, the five aren't available for the entire property. It's two at one and three at the other. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, Ms. Cooper, I made a number of promises to you last November, December, and I have not fulfilled them yet, but I still intend to do that. Just want to put that out there. Well, I will hope so. Um, I really have been very patient and I do appreciate yeah. you taking the time out to listen to me. Um, as I stated, Marbury Plaza been crying out to you and Mr. White for a while. Both of y'all have been on the property. Both of y'all have been in my home and y'all have walked the property. It's not like y'all don't know what's going on. Y'all have seen it with your own eyes and D.O.B. need to have um, oversight. Period. It's no ifs, ands. We would not be sitting here if they would do their job. HUD would do their job. We would not be sitting here today. Period. People got to be held accountable. Simple as that. So I still intend to, to fulfill the promises that I made. Let me, okay. in the couple Thank minutes you. I have left, uh, ask um, Ms. Christides. Uh, so you had some comments about, uh, I think it's Reinspection that you want in person verification of abatement. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, I believe that was the recommendation um, in the report. Not entirely. Not to disagree. I mean, maybe I misunderstand, but I wanted to pursue this a little bit. Um, I think what the report says is that if the if the tenant has not uh, Oh, I have it somewhere here. I may use up my time looking for this. Um, no, that's too far. Reinspection. So if the department comes out and uh, presumably fixes the violation, should there be a reinspection, in person reinspection in every instance? Um, I'm sorry. Are you saying if the department fixes it or if the housing provider fixes it? I misspoke it? if I said the department fixes it. The department comes out, they say there's a violation. And um, they say there's a violation, they issue an NOI. Uh, there's supposed to be a reinspection. I think it's uh, three to seven days of its emergency, 60 days, within 60 days if it's not an emergency. Should the department come out and reinspect? 
I believe the report suggested that reinspection should only happen if neither the landlord nor the tenant. Um, let me see if I can get this right. If either the landlord or the tenant are claiming that the the violations are abate, abated, then there's less. If the tenant is confirming that the violations are abated, there isn't need for an automatic reinspection. I think if the landlord is contending that the violations have been abated and the tenant is is notified of that contention or that assertion and is disputing it, then I think um, it's it, it can be up to the department whether they decide to reinspect in person based on the tenant's uh, disputing that the items are abated if, if the department is convinced that the landlord is actually correct for some reason. Um, well, let me, I found this. The, the department should revise its standard operating procedure for conducting inspections. Do away with the reinspection requirement when neither the tenant nor the housing provider has indicated the violation has been abated. Um, which I think what that says is if there's no, if there's just silence after the NOI, then the department shouldn't come out to reinspect. That's what I took that to mean as well. And um, you which, agree. Yeah, I think that that might be a better use of resources, but I think that also assumes that then the department is pursuing the NOI and pursuing subsequent enforcement steps. Okay, that was kind of an important caveat at the end. That the department is pursuing enforcement efforts. Right. The point about in-person reinspection really just goes to the unreliable nature of, I think, what is the current practice, which is that landlords can submit, quote, proof of abatement, but these can just be photographs or invoices that don't, I think, necessarily, they're not sufficiently probative of whether something has really been abated. And I don't believe that tenants are being notified that landlords are submitting these documents and not really giving being given an opportunity to dispute or contest the the uh, probative nature of those of those photographs or those documents. So if there were both systems built in to allow for tenants to dispute the landlord submitted proof of abatement, and maybe in that instance an ability for the department to perform the in-person reinspection to kind of get to the bottom of the matter. I think that that would be ideal. I think the the problem is that the current system is not sufficiently reliable and not nor are tenants being notified that landlords are submitting proof of abatement and that's resolving the issue even if they disagree that something has been abated. I'm sort of thinking of it a little bit differently. I don't want to put too much burden on the tenant. Um if it's an emergency I sort of feel like the department should come out, and I know that's not what the report says, but that the department should come out and see if it was abated. If there's no heat. I think that's serious enough if, if we're talking about in the winter, um, that the department should come out, and I think it should come out sooner than seven days. Um, if it's a less serious violation, perhaps at the time the tenant files the complaint, as well as when the inspector comes out, that um, the tenant should be told, please contact us if this is not abated. And then there doesn't have to be a reinspection if the landlord says it's been abated. Looking for a reaction. I'm over my that... time. Don't use up all the rest of my time that doesn't right. exist. I, th I think that actually puts more of a burden on the tenants to affirmatively reach out again and say it hasn't been abated. I think if there's a little bit more of an automatic, um, a, somewhat more of an automated system where the tenant is, set, is informed, um, you know, the, the landlord says it's abated. Do you agree or do, do you disagree? Or we're filing the we're filing the NOI at OAH because we believe the items are not abated. If you disagree, you can let us know. I think expecting the tenant to affirmatively reach out on their own timeline puts more of a burden on the tenant. All right, um, Councilor White. Uh, thank you, Chairman Mendelson. Thank you to uh, these witnesses. Um, Ms. Uh, Ms. Cooper, I continue to understand your frustration. And if I were in your shoes, I would be just as angry 
uh, as you are. Um, <clears throat> when you came to my office with Stomp Out Slum Lords, I did not want to be a bearer of bad news, but I told everybody in that room, social housing bill was not going to fix that issue as, as those folks had tried to convince you. Um, and I, I didn't want to give you bad news, but I wanted to shoot straight. Um, <clears throat> we have the power of receivership, but you can kick out the existing bad owner, but that doesn't give you the money to fix the issues. So that doesn't completely fix uh, the issue. Uh, to, to your point earlier, Ms. Hamilton, about being proactive, years ago, I passed a bill creating a nuisance abatement fund, very similar to the language uh, you all are, are recommending uh, in, in your legislative recommendations. That fund already exists. I created it years ago, and the mayor already has authority uh, under our nuisance abatement laws to correct conditions that violate our regulations. But it's not happened, right? Um, all that to say... I, I hate being a bearer of bad news, but we don't need to just do something. We need to figure out a solution, and it is difficult. Um, I haven't given up on it. I won't give up on it. You will continue to be frustrated with me because I'm not going to do something that's not going to help you, um, and I'm going to keep looking for, for the answer. Um, this is an issue at Marbury Plaza. This is a, for people who don't know, massive property uh, where the, the deterioration and neglect is very real, is very visible, and it happened over decades. And we're not going to be able to fix it overnight, but I do believe we will find a solution. Uh, I know you're not going to let it go, and 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 you shouldn't. Um, but I'm going to continue to, to shoot straight with you. Uh, when I have the answer, I'm going to tell you. When I don't have the answer, I'm going to tell you that. When, when somebody or you present a proposed solution and I don't think it's going to get where, where, you, where you want it to go, I'm going to be straight with you, and I'm going to tell you that. Um, and so I think we're going to have more tough conversations, but we are going to get to the finish line on this. Um, can I, I ask you a question? Can I respond as okay, well? Okay, can I respond to that, please? Sure. Um, <clears throat> number one, um, you said that you wasn't for the Greenleaf deal. No, 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 uh, I didn't say or, that. Okay, it's, well. It, does, it won't help your condition. That's a great bill, but it's not going to fix the issues at Marbury Plaza. Okay, well, again... I think that they, like I said, they hijacked it, uh, Marbury Plaza, and and put us in that loop. And my thing is, it's it's not a hard fix because what y'all doing, it's not working. And we we already submitted um, the amendments. You know, um, y'all done tried everything else that everyone else uh, asked. We we lost that topo rights. We lost bank. We in bankruptcy. You know, it's like we are going through everything. The tenants are the ones that's struggling the most, and you all hold the upper hand to help the situation instead of y'all going after the landlord. Help us. Help ourselves. Y'all making us struggle more. Y'all are making people die over there, living over there in them them conditions. I don't think it's right, and I don't think it's fair. I understand. Council Member White, I would like to piggyback on what Ms. Cooper said, and I appreciate your response. Um, I don't believe you guys have what we submitted, and if you do, then I would say that uh, shame on you all for failing these tenants from an enforcement standpoint. And yes, we have had several tough conversations, and I invite them, because if we're comfortable, we're not succeeding in getting the proper changes in place. Part of, and the biggest part of what we presented to you is that there is not tenant engagement when you guys, or at least we don't feel you're talking to enough of the proper tenants when you're forming your legislation or your fixes. And the reality is it's leaving them vulnerable. Um, they don't have the luxury of waiting for you to figure it out. Um, simply because poor community and housing codes and enforcements uh, lead to poor health outcomes. And these are the parts of the conversations we fail to get to because we're still reacting to what you believe is a fix or is not a fix. What we're simply saying to you is that these tenants, not just Marbury Plaza, Chesapeake Street, as well as Nash Place have uh, complaints regarding their TOPA rights being violated. But when you sit as the chair of the Committee of Housing and say you're not well versed on TOPA, I that doesn't that. give them. That just, that I'm, I'm just the I'm using your words. A meeting. And I'm I using your words. What All you were suggesting about TOPA. I didn't cut you off, and I would appreciate it if you didn't cut me off. I, I need to you. reclaim my time. Um, and please, that's please fine. Finish. I just want to share with you that all of these conditions that they are living through in real time 
are not, they don't have the luxury of waiting for you to decide whether or not what they're saying to you is valid. I they have never valid questioned input. The Let's there not, needs to I'm be a tenant task force. Right. We'll You've had active. plenty of opportunity to provide proper levels of oversight and it's failing. All right, I appreciate line. that. Um, Ms. Uh, mm -hmm. Evans, um, when you, uh, I appreciate uh, you both, uh, Ms. Evans and Ms. Gordon being with us today. Uh, when you are working with uh, DOB, how how often would you like to hear from them with updates? I feel like <clears throat> I feel like again, perfect example. My situation with the fees is coming up. Um, it took it didn't take long for the inspections to come, but after they came and after it was quote unquote fixed. Nothing else was said. No one else showed up. Nothing was said to me. Nothing. So I feel like if something is being done and the inspector, they need to come back out and check and make sure it's done properly. And then at least say something to the person that's in that apartment or whatever, like, hey, okay, well, it, it did pass or something like that. Give us some type of notification. Okay. No. Um have there been other repairs uh, for uh, either of you, uh, Ms. Evans or, or Ms. Gordon, um, or repairs that you know of where somebody has come on the back end to inspect to make sure the repair was done? Not to my knowledge, no. Well, my experience is um, where, I, because I follow up and communicate with people anyway, even if I don't hear anything, I do try to reach out to people. And I have had contact with um, particular inspectors um, where they did call or just ask me, you know, was something fixed? Um, and then here recently, I did receive a phone call from one of the DOB attorneys where she was addressing the, um, the, the fees or the amount of the fine, or they were trying to figure out the amount to, for the property management to pay. And, um, and, and that was a form of a type of a follow-up. But then I also found out that another one of my residents um, made the same report that I made in July about the air conditioner not working in August. So I did, she sent me her paperwork and their, the inspection, this was August, 2023. Follow-up wasn't until December 29, 2023. That's like months, um, months apart. Yeah. So in between all of that, I made a report about the AC not working. I talked to some of the contractors that came out and fixed it. Um, I didn't particularly get any follow-up about reinspection from my report, but my other tenant did uh, for the December 29th date, which was after their court date for my original um, complaint with DOB. So it's just a lot of inconsistencies. Um, and then I also feel as if that um, if they're going to come out, why give them notice? If if they're going to fix it, if they give if you're if they're given the opportunity to fix something, then it should just show up and have them show you where the spot is. If it's fixed, it, you should be able to show me that it's fixed. And I should be able to report to the tenant or to you all or whoever that this is fixed from my own eyesight and not just from a picture or the form that they fill out saying something is done or an invoice, like that's not sufficient. I should be put on these areas that they're saying that aren't sufficient or need to be abated or what have you, they should be able to come back out and inspect those areas. So communication is important for that, for the tenant, as well as um, the property management. I think more so the tenant should be notified about that follow-up versus the, the property management. Because I think they get enough notice sometimes because some inspectors do go in and give them notice when they're coming. So then that gives them an opportunity to try to quick fix something because I've seen that happen. Um, so it's just a lot of different aspects of it that could be fixed. Thank you very much. I'm about to double my time. I apologize, thank uh, Chairman. Thank you to this panel. Yes, but I went over, so that's why I didn't watch. Uh, thank you, each of you, for your testimony. And as I noted, we have uh, your statements, so that's that's very helpful. So let me call the next uh, group of um, witnesses. I had earlier called Cornelia Hill, who was not here. But if she's logged on, she has another chance. Uh, Laura Askew. Desmond Qualey or Qualey? I'm guessing it's Qualey. Yvonne Trent Hunter. 
Sandra Bray. Uh, Harold uh, Harold Thompson McKenna Osborne are we supposed to be responding to you as you call us no you're supposed to be accepting the invitation to come online or okay yes. think that's happening right i will call you in turn okay thank you um uh, mckenna osborne iris moore salima dofo no i have not read what anybody's affiliation is I think I said Salima Dofo, uh, Janet Phoenix. And I think I'll stop there. So I believe uh, Cornelia Hill is not here. Laura Askew, you would be first up. Ms. Askew, I see your name on the screen. You need to unmute and preferably turn on your video. Unmute. Good afternoon. Excellent. Good afternoon. Good. I think we're still morning. Yes, no, oh, I'm sorry. Good morning. No, no, I'm wrong. Good afternoon. Okay, we're a little bit after 12. Yes, sir. So I'm representing uh, 760 Chesapeake Street. My complaint is I had um, construction to renovate my building. It's a 12 floor, I mean, three floor building, 12 units. We had four units redone. The other four is undone. There was multiple fines placed on the door, but for some reason they were still able to come in and re-renovate four units. Um, I didn't understand it, how they was able to get past the fines. What do we do when they are fined, but they still can come in and do construction? I filed multiple complaints against them, but nothing was done. And I found out that the company's uh, license was stripped to do anything in DC. But I had nobody to uh, advocate for me. So what do I do when these things like this come up? Um, I have a history for my unit. Uh, nothing has ever been, I, don't, I can't even recall of a recertification or inspection from 2015 to now. Only inspection I've had was the ones that I have called DHS to come in and do, but on our annual inspection, never had one done from 2015 to today. So I'm asking for answers also today for me and my tenants. Um, I've tried legal aid, neighborhood, all types of aids to get some assistance. Uh, they can only give advice but no representation. What do we do? These are my arguments today. Does that conclude your testimony? Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. And I have your statement. Yes, um, sir. Thank you. I think Desmond, Qual Desmond Quali is here. You're next. Whaley? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. 
Okay, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. And thank you for hearing me. Um, my name is Desmond Quayley. When I moved into Marbury Plaza in 2016, little did I know the challenges I was about to experience in the coming years upon signing my lease. I discovered 43 issues with my apartment. The issues are, some of the issues are um, gas oven burner partly lying on the floor still attached to the range, apartment front door that could not be locked upon exiting, unfinished floors, damage and non-working room doors. Damaged closet, wall doors, old, um, old rusted over paint fixtures, leaking roof twice, no consistent heat in the winter and no air in the summer for days at times when temperatures are over 100 degrees. Prolonged water shutoffs in many cases without notice, no consistent hot water. Where is DOB in all of this? Mice, roaches, and recently the discovery of mold. In some of the common areas, poor lighting in hallways, and at times no lighting, missing handrails and step, missing floor tiles in hallways, broken front door entrance glass panels, broken front door locks, unable to enter building, non-working laundry room machines for weeks and months at a time, forcing tenants to travel to neighborhood laundromats, poorly maintained laundry rooms, um, inconsistent garbage collection, rat infestation. As far as security, Property plagued with drugs, including users and dealers, abandoned vehicles, vehicle thefts, vehicle broken into. My vehicle was broken into twice in the past two consecutive years. I have yet to receive a call or communication from MPD. Rapes, murders, shootings. My question, um, I had to seek out, well, actually I had to seek out and pay for attorney to threaten Marbury Plaza with lawsuits just to fix the 43 items when I first moved in. Tenants should not have to go through these lengths to live decently in their own homes and communities, regardless of their social status or income. My question is, if a DC Superior Court judge has determined tenants are living in uninhabitable, uninhabitable conditions, why hasn't DOB stepped in and performed a property-wide inspection to grasp the full magnitude of tenant situation instead of waiting for one-off complaints in a flawed DOB process based on your own DC housing code inspection report that I'm actually looking at as well? Why hasn't DOB maintained aggressive? Why hasn't DOB been more aggressive um, in overseeing the NOIs? R's, the NOIRs and the NOIEs are completed on a timelier schedule than the current one. Why haven't the council and its members been more proactive in passing legislation protecting tenants instead of landlords? For example, stiffer penalties, fines, and repairs when landlords don't comply with DC housing codes. DOB's current reactionary process to the district tenants um, who are living in communities where the ownership and management are allowed to collect rents amidst a mounting of housing code violation, in, um, in my opinion, encourages slumlord behavior. The health and rights of DC tenants continue to be violated without the presence of accountable systematic oversight. Why should district tenants have a fate in a system that continues to fail them? I am disappointed with the current city's leadership and appalled by the subpar representation provided to us as district tenants by representative in the OAG's office and their supporting agencies concerning Marbury Plaza tenants' ongoing exposure to egregious housing code violations. How could responsible city leaders allow us, their residents, to live like this and act as if we should continue to trust in their capabilities? I support having amendments to the current DOB inspection oversight process to include a tenant-led task force to help ensure that district tenants have effective and input action regarding housing code violations and higher established living standards for citizens residing in district rental communities. I will go on to say, we keep hearing um, council members say to us that they are aware or have visited the property before. My question to you is, did you visit the property back in the good days, the bad days, or now it's worse days? Members of the Tenants Association came down to the council building late last year to invite the mayor to visit the property so she could see for herself the condition her residents are living in. And we have been met with silence. 
it appears that we are no longer important to her. But I do remember when she was running for mayor, she would show up at the opening of a can of a tuna fish to get support and votes. I suggest we don't, I guess we don't rise to the level of tuna fish now. That's why she's not showing up. Thank you for your opportunity to present my testimony here today. I look forward to the immediate changes to DOB housing code violation system that will directly and positively impact my living environments and the tenants of Marbury Plaza. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clearly. Yvonne Trent Hunter, is that you? Excellent, please proceed. Good afternoon, everyone who's present. My name is Yvonne Trent Hunter, and I'm the president of the Nash Place Tenant Association. And I'd like to address this panel on the apartment building, which is lacking in transparency and the protocols and procedures that are created by them. We, the citizens of East of the River, would like to have the same quality of living, just like all of you who are presently sitting here today. We shouldn't matter even though we do not have the financial status as many who are present residing or moving into our striving city. DOB is currently not following the protocol that was created by them. We have no knowledge on the steps that should be implemented when problems or infractions are discovered by the tenant or your organization. If the problem has been corrected or fines have been implemented, how would we know when it when it's going on, what issues have been taken care of? Are they sweeping it under the rug or do they just vanish in the air? I live in a small community located in the east of the river, as I said, and the building I reside in was built in 1924. They are still equipped and equipped like we are still living in 1924. Many buildings still have fuse boxes, not circuit breakers. How many of you still have to change fuses in your house? They are not wired for 2024 appliances, which means a lot of fuses have to be changed. Tragically, in 2023, a building caught a fire. Thank God no one was killed or injured, and there is a major rodent problem. Some residents are dealing with serious mold issues because there's no ventilation. The buildings are deteriorating due to age, just like our bodies as we age. We must continue to live in this uh, decapitated building because you are all aware we have nowhere to go unless we move to Tent City. We do not want to continue paying our money but live in a place that we will give us comfort and not just a place to cohabitate. We just want to live in dignity and be comfortable just like you. Lastly, we are living in a city which is a sanctuary city, but there's a long, there's long-term residents like third, fourth, and fifth generation Washingtonians, and I'm one, who helped build this city for decades, living worse than the animals residing in the humane societies. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Trent Hunter. Sandra Bray, I don't believe she's here. Harold Thompson? Here, I'm here. <laughs> I guess I was muted again. Oh, there's a name under you that says Desmond Quayley. So, Desmond spoke proceed. already. Okay, well, thank you. I uh, appreciate being able to speak on the call. Um, from a tenant's perspective on DOB, I was really happy to see that a committee had been formed to do some investigative research on how to improve uh, the functionings of DOB. I was chagrined to, to once again find myself uh, not informed of that. And I understand that this has been going on for uh, a couple of months. And I know that uh, we've been in Mr. White's office, uh, and uh, it's just funny to me that nothing was mentioned about this. Uh, so I found out about it last night. So while I'm I'm glad to see some of the recommendations being made for education and for processing improvement, um, 
overall, I'm chagrined about the notification. I'll speak first of all about uh, the communications with DOB representatives and online. Um, it, the communications is extremely poor from my perspective. Uh, when representatives come, they 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 may or might might they may or may not actually show up. I've been told that they were at my door when they were obviously never at my door, and when asked for uh, some proof of notice that they were at my door, they couldn't give me anything uh, in those regards. Um, they refuse the options that the law gives them and blame it on policy as though policy is law. For example, if I'm asking for documentation for an on-site uh, investigation or on-site inspection, sorry, um, I am told that they cannot give it to me, the policy prohibits it, when actually I understand that they have the option. Um, for things like that, I think uh, these regulations, these codes need to be made mandatory uh, so that we are able to get the documentations that we need on site uh, during the initial uh, um, inspection and in terms of follow up that we're that we're getting some feedback on that. Um, I heard you asking about how often follow up should occur. Uh, in an emergency situation, I would say uh, every day or every other day on a 60-day consideration, um, periodically, but depending on the situation. But I really do think it needs to occur. Um, for example, uh, Judge Kravitz has stated in his court order that on-site um, inspections validating that mold and asbestos abatements have have been completed just by sight is not acceptable. Yet that's what's being done, um, which also brings me to the situation with mold and asbestos. Mold is, and asbestos is not a joke. I see so many people that are reverting to walkers and wheelchairs and oxygen tanks that did not come on this property with those problems. And yet we are obliged to continue to have to live here while these court battles are going on, uh, even though we're living in uninhabitable conditions. And now we're being asked to pay rent to live here in order to support the receivership when the city won't even <laughs> support the receivership. But to just to get back on pace with this, um, I'm, I'm thinking we need more mandatory regulation than optional regulation in these regards. When we deal with links on the website, uh, that's difficult to navigate. Every link that I've been given to, to get to follow up um, uh, attention has led me right back to an initial request. So we keep going back to initial requests and we're just caught up in that loop while again, we continue to live in these egregious situations. Um, charts on property owners, um, the charts that the on property owners that, um, that DOB has on their website are inconsistent. For example, in July, I, we were told by Jason Phillips that the problem with uh, DOB and Marbury Plaza is that there were less than three or four tenants that had actually requested inspections. So I went back to find proof of that. And it, at first, I was directed to go through FOI, F, FOIA, but in, eventually I got a link to the chart that shows the siting, what progress has been made, whether a fine is issued, whether it's been paid or not. And when I looked in July, there were a lot of requests, sightings that were done going from 2023 back to 2020, but there was only one unit that had a fine associated with it 
for $14,000 three times. I looked a month later and then there were a lot of fines listed on that same chart. I looked a month later and I couldn't even draw MPPPH up on the chart at all. So, you know, what can we do with information that's inconsistent like that? We really don't feel like we know what's going on. Once again, communication is really bad. Um, Ms. Bray, you're three minutes over your time. Okay, so well, if you could rip it up. Okay, well, I just would like to say that I am encouraging um, Robert White's office and the council in, at large to consider the amendments that we have submitted um, for the tenants uh, abatement. Oh God, what is it for? For the tenants housing. Um. Task force. That's what it is. Robert White, I heard you say that you already have one um, in existence. It's there. I remember you saying that you find there's some problem with enforcement. I'm just surprised that you didn't bring it up and that you didn't work with us more on developing that so that we can get something that can work. And um, Thank you, with Ms. that, Craig. I'll close. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Harold Thompson. Good afternoon, members of the council. Thank you for the opportunity to provide some insight to what has been a very difficult situation. I am a resident of the of District of Columbia and have been a resident of Marbury Plaza since February 2013. When I moved into the plaza, it was a fairly maintained property for the first couple of years. After the first two years, things began to change and problems began to multiply and accelerate beginning with removing the concierge service without notifying the tenants, even though the property was being advertised in apartment listing as having concierge service. Next, it was the swimming pool, now opening for, for in the summer months for three consecutive years, 2017 through 2020. Then the security service was discontinued. The lack of security and open access to the building allowed non-residents to enter the building at random. People sleep in the laundry room, hallways, and stairwells. Next came the rodent infestation, along with the roaches, which made living on the property almost unbearable. Currently, there are issues with mold and asbestos. While some efforts have been made to remediate the problem with mold and asbestos, the problem still persists. There is an ongoing a persistent problem with no hot water, sometimes for days on end. No heat in the winter months, no, no AC during the summer months. It has been well documented through various, landlo through various landlord tenant court proceedings that the problems are not limited to one building. The, property, the problems are pervasive throughout the property. Tenants have large complaints with DCHA as well as Department of Business. However, the response time to investigate and remediate Complaints have been slow. When investigations uncover housing violations, the follow up compelling management to make repairs and resolve the issue seem to get lost in the bureaucracy. For example, I made a complaint of what has been the DCRA about an issue with the automatic no interest to the front of the building. The sensor that opens the door was inoperable and had been inoperable for a couple of weeks. If there had been a fire, Tenants would not have been able to, act, to, to easily act, exit the building in a safe and expeditious manner. It took well over one week for a representative to, from, from uh, DCHA to visit the property. And when the representative finally did show up, he was very dismissive and stated that tenants could use the side entrance to exit the building in the event of a fire. That is unacceptable. Let me interrupt. You said a representative from DCHA, that's the Housing Authority, or do you mean the Department of Buildings? The DC Housing Authority at that particular time. Okay. In another instance in 2021, when the same door was broken, uh, anyone could simply walk into the building. One morning, as I was walking to, to, from the elevator to the lobby, mm -hmm. there was a raccoon in the lobby, a huge raccoon. He simply ran out of the door when he saw me. The point is, he was able to walk into the building because the door was wide open. 
That's unacceptable. In 2022, when the roof was unrepaired, some sparks from the repair work got into the shaft and destroyed the laundry room for each of the 11 floors in the building. Complaints to DCRA went unanswered for weeks. Although complaints were made to the management, it took DCRA almost 18 months before it took the management company almost 18 months before the repairs were actually made. I believe the complaints about poor service from DOB are not taken seriously. I also believe that each member of this council knows that if these type of complaints were made by residents west of the park, the response would have been totally different. This is just not my opinion, it's the general perception of many of the residents at Marlboro Plaza. I realize that each witness speaker is limited to three minutes, and I know that others have information they want to present. However, the manner in which DOB responds to customer complaints is only part of the equation. The other part, and I will argue the central part of the problem is the lack of accountability. The residential housing, the residential housing industry knows that if they can essentially get away with, with flouting laws of DC, because there's a higher probability, a higher probability that they will not be held accountable. So from the owner's perspective, rather than make repairs, it's easy to let the violation to continue because they're not held accountable. There's no, I won't say no fines, but they haven't been fined, they're not been held accountable. In other words, it's cheaper for the housing violation to continue rather than to make repairs. It's a matter of economics for the ownership and the management. Meanwhile, the tenants bear the burden of fighting an uphill battle against the government bureaucracy. Management companies, the property owners, and the Department of, and the Department of Buildings. DOB, on their website, the mission statement reads, it is to protect the safety of residents, businesses, visitors, and advance the development of the building of the built environment through permitting inspections and code enforcement. And we know the reason we're here today is because of the lack of code enforcement. That's why we're here. Tenants in many apartment dwellings around the city suffer from health issues, which in many cases are, are exacerbated by mold, asbestos, and rodent infestations. I do not expect this hearing will bring about an immediate change. I'm saying the change that this process will take time. Hopefully, and I mean this in, 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 in a disrespectful manner, hopefully this, this hearing is not another dog and pony show for the benefit of, of, of the consumption of the people of the city. This not, hopefully, this is not what this hearing is about. Hopefully the hearing is designed to bring about some, some positive constructive solutions to address these issues that we were, we're experiencing. Finally, and I certainly do not want to minimize their contribution, it is uncomfortable for the DC Housing Authority, Authority to continue to pay rent to landlords and owners who fail to make repairs, who flaunt the laws of DC without making repairs and just disregard the laws that you, as a council, pass. That's unacceptable. To me, this represents a failure to be good stewards of the taxpayers' dollars and to make the government complicit in these housing violations. I want to thank you for the opportunity to respond today, and uh, thank you for listening to me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, Mr. Thompson, um, I just want to be clear here. There may be some questions after we're done with all the witnesses. You've mentioned three different agencies, DCRA, which was replaced by Department of Buildings, and you mentioned the Housing Authority, um, and you meant each of the three. So the Housing Authority, because they have uh, some subsidies or voucher units in the building, and then the Department of Buildings, because they do the inspections now in DCRA because they predated Department of Buildings. All right. Thank you. There may be some questions for you, but let me... Um, Go to the next witness, uh, McKenna Oswald. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson and members of the committee. My name is McKenna Osborne, 
and I'm a policy attorney at Children's Law Center and a resident of the district. I'm testifying today on behalf of Children's Law Center. Our more than 100 staff work with DC children and families, community partners, and pro bono attorneys toward a future where every child can grow up with a strong foundation of family, health, and education and live in a world free from poverty, trauma, racism, and other forms of oppression. Thank you to the committee and its staff for conducting a thorough investigation of the Department of Buildings Housing Code inspection process and convening today's hearing to discuss how DOB can improve its rental inspection. Children's Law Center regularly works with families living in unsafe and unsanitary rental housing. And DOB plays a critical role in helping these families secure repairs from their landlords. We appreciate the agency's willingness to engage with our staff and hope the open working relationship we've developed over the past year will continue. In my time today, I want to highlight some of the reasons why the inspection process is so frustrating and disappointing for the tenants we work with. My upcoming performance oversight testimony will focus on inspection outcomes. First, DOB's preferred method for receiving housing complaints is their online form, which as the committee noted in its report, many tenants find confusing and difficult to use. But in our experience, it's at least a reliable way to schedule an inspection. Unfortunately, the same can't be said for the phone number DOB provides to tenants. Our attorneys and clients struggle to connect with anyone when they call the number. It's not clear if that's due to DOB not answering or responding to calls or because the pre-recorded menu it takes callers to is difficult to navigate. Further, neither the online form nor phone number include an option for language translation. We urge the committee to ask DOB about their plans to improve the accessibility and reliability of these processes so all tenants, regardless of access to a computer and the internet, technology literacy, or level of English can successfully notify DB of harmful conditions in their home. Once DOB completes an inspection, tenants are left in the dark. Children's Law Center frequently speaks with families who had an inspection months earlier, but don't know if DOB is doing anything about what they observed. Instead of communicating directly with tenants, DOB suggests that they monitor the agency's public dashboard. The violations show up in their unit uh, will be on the dashboard when an NOI has been filed and removed if a landlord self-certifies abatement. DOB collects tenant contact information when they file a complaint, so we hope the committee will ask the agency about what needs to be done to integrate that information across DOB's systems so they can automatically update tenants at key steps in the inspection and enforcement process. If DOB is to become a truly tenant-focused agency, they need to center the tenant experience and significantly improve their communication with tenants. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I welcome any questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Osborne. Iris Moore. Uh, I don't think she's here. Salima Dofo. I don't think he's here. Uh, Janet Phoenix. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I can see you as well. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Mendelson and members of the committee. Um, I am presenting this testimony regarding the department buildings um, on behalf of the campaign to reduce lead exposure and asthma, a coalition of more than 50 organizations working together to improve housing conditions that contribute to lead poisoning and asthma in residents in DC, primarily those who live in poorly maintained rental housing. I want to commend the committee for undertaking this examination of the operations of the Department of Buildings, specifically those related to housing code inspection and enforcement activities. My comments on the report are as follows. I applaud and fully support the recommendation to include more hands-on interactive training for personnel. Um, I have personally conducted more than 25 training sessions for the DC Housing Authority on healthy housing, on topics like moisture intrusion, ventilation, mold, pest infestations, as well as lead exposure and safe work practices. And I developed these curricular materials by extracting content 
uh, from um, sites uh, and, and materials that are maintained by CDC, HUD, and EPA. My goal in conducting the training was to try to help DCHA's personnel to understand the link between housing conditions and adverse health outcomes um, with an emphasis on asthma and lead poisoning. Um, and we included information about inspection practices and protocols. And I'd be happy to share these training materials with DOB um, and to demonstrate the curriculum, which was designed as a train the trainer initiative. I completely concur uh, with regard to complaints. I completely recur, uh, concur with the conclusion in the report that the complaint process fails to adequately capture uh, tenant complaints and poses unnecessary obstacles to people who are trying to use the system. Um, an email or phone option that works would make this more accessible for people and allow them to use plain language to describe the problems they are attempting to report rather than trying to fit these categories that appear um, on the online portal. Uh, with regard to scheduling and conducting inspections, uh, it is a waste of scarce resources to inspect if neither the tenant nor the property owner has reported that the conditions have been corrected. Rather, uh, keep the powder dry and conduct follow-up inspections uh, to determine if the violations have actually been corrected once the property owner has um, filed uh, something that indicates that they've undertaken repairs. And there should also be a mechanism for people to reschedule an appointment without having to go through the entire complaint process from start to finish. With regard to issuing notices of infraction, there appears to be a fundamental and underlying problem with knowing who owns rental properties in DC. I fail to understand how a building owner can be allowed to lease space to families without providing accurate and up-to-date information on their identity, um, as well as their contact information. This may need a legislative fix, but it seems to me that administrative actions could be taken in the interim to ensure that this information is collected prior to giving landlords permission to grant leases to tenants. Um, with regard to the fines, I have no strong opinion on the timing of the fines, but I do have a strong opinion on their adequacy, or rather their inadequacy. Uh, the fine amounts seem small compared to the potential harm that can be inflicted on tenants and their family members who suffer from housing related health conditions. For one example, a child who goes to the ER for a single visit for an asthma attack incurs a cost of about $2,000. Many children are, with asthma in DC are insured through the Medicaid program. So a portion of that cost is borne by the federal government. But the other portion comes from the city budget. Um, their parents or caregivers may have to miss a day of work for which they may or may not be compensated depending on the nature of their employment. In addition, um, children have to miss school very often and those lost days of instruction have resulted in some children having to repeat a grade. DC is very strict about attendance, even if you have a good reason for missing school days in the academic year. So all of these costs add up and it seems the city is subsidizing the ability of landlords to put off making repairs to housing that negatively impact the health of the residents. With regard to abatement, I, I support requiring in-person inspections to verify that abatement has taken place. I do agree that uh, a letter to the owner prior to uh, a scheduled inspection would probably encourage some action um, and may avoid some uh, notices having to be issued. Um, with regard to settlement and adjudication of infractions, if the underlying problem of figuring out who owns the building can be solved, then the number of infractions that has to be refer referred to OAH might be reduced. This could help to alleviate what appears to be a bottleneck. Performance measures are needed, but the pipeline also needs to be addressed so that the majority of infractions don't have to go down that path to OAH. Um, similarly, the pipeline to alternative resolution could increase if you notify property owners at the time that they're given permission to grant leases about the, the possibility of ART 
um, an alternative resolution of infractions. Thanks for the opportunity to testify. The campaign to reduce lead exposure and asthma is happy to answer questions, provide any additional information. As the Committee of the Whole considers ways to improve housing code inspection and enforcement in DC. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Phoenix. Uh, so that concludes the witnesses for this group. Uh, one round of five minutes for questions. I don't have very many questions, but I did want to ask Ms. Trent Hunter um, tell me more about Nash Place. Where is it and how many units? Oh, I'm sorry. Three blocks from Pennsylvania Avenue, going towards Benning Road. Okay. If I'm going toward Benning Road on the right or left? If you're coming, if you turn it off of Pennsylvania to Minnesota, we're on the left hand side. On the left side. And about how many units? Um, it's twenty-four, it's twenty-three four unit buildings. Twenty-three four unit buildings. Uh -huh. So that's almost a hundred units. Basically, yeah. Hundred years old. It was built in nineteen twenty four. I'm looking at your statement. I want, just wanted to ask you more about the property. Um, but you you found that um, <clears throat> inspections have not been very fruitful. Well, can I retract? Back in, when I moved in in 2009, the first day I moved there, I had to call uh, DCRA because we had no heat. We're talking about their process. Back then, their process was this way. I called them that morning. The inspector called me that evening, came to my unit, inspected it, went to the rental office, called me back and told me someone would be there in, in two hours. If not, they would be fine. I received a letter two, maybe two weeks later. They find that apartment complex $10,000 for me not having heat. Did the heat come back on two yeah, hours? They, they came within, it wasn't within two hours. Because a, a young lady called me back around, I called her around nine and she called me back around four and asked me that I had heat yet and I told her no. They gave them an infraction of $10,000 because I got a form. It was like a, maybe a carbon copy. that they sent them one, I guess they kept one and they sent me one. That's how it was done in 2009. And when did the inspector came out? You said that evening. No, he came out. She came there. I, I called her at 9. She was there at 1030. 1030 in the morning. Yes, sir. So an hour and a half after you called. Yes, indeed. I want to repeat that. So the inspector came out an hour and a half after you yes, called. She did. Called me and said she was on Pennsylvania Avenue and said she's coming. I told her yes. And if you can recall, 2009 was the year that we had the big snowstorm. Yeah, but this wasn't during the snowstorm. No, it was three days before, three or four days before. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Qualey, just a quick question for you. Uh, maybe it's not a question. You said in your statement you had some questions. Why haven't this council, why hasn't this council and its members been more proactive in passing legislation protecting tenants instead of landlords? Stiffer penalties, fines, repairs when landlords don't comply with the housing code. I keep hearing testimony today about fines in the thousands of dollars. Now, one of the things that we look at is whether those fines are actually collected or paid. And I think that's important. But I don't know that it needs to be, we need to change the law regarding having heftier fines. If landlords are already being fined thousands of dollars or $10,000, um, I don't know that we need to increase the fine amount, but uh, certainly we need to figure out how to ensure that those fines are paid. So that's sort of my response to you, but do you want to respond to me? Yes, it seems to me um, from what I've gathered in the few years I've been here, it seems to me like 
yes, they're being fined. The question is, how stiff are the penalties? As well as, are they actually paying these fines? Correct. So that's another piece that I can't figure out. Are the landlords paying these fines? How stiff are the penalties? And then are any of the fines, basically, if they, for example, um, abate the problem within 60 days, are these fines just canceled? Because from my perspective with that, if any of these fines are just abated or just are basically not collected or these fines just go away because they have fixed the problem, well, then what happens to the tenant who has endured the situation up to those 60 days? They still have been, they still have gone through some sort of, you know, mental anguish. I'm just saying, you know, it could have been the situation with their, um, you know, with their housing. As a matter of fact, we saw pictures when we were in court, Mr. Mendelson, of a tenant that had um, mushrooms growing out his ceiling. So my thing is that if those fines were, if he, if the owner was fined for those things, and then 60 days later or you know, or on the 59th day, he fixed those things. Uh, is that money still not collected or does that fine just disappear? That's my question that I can't seem to understand or um, no, because it seemed like if, for example, in the Marbury Plaza case, yes, this owner has been fined. We don't know how many, how much money has been collected because um, we don't know. What you don't know, you don't know. Because nothing is very transparent with Marbury Plaza and this owner. So I'm very concerned as to um, the process and is the process working or holding this owner accountable. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And you make some good points. Uh, Council Member White. Uh, thank you uh, to, to this panel. I apologize. I had to step out and got stuck for a minute. There were uh, residents having issues in, in shelters. Uh, there's... Uh, that's right here, Tubman. Um, so always trying to manage multiple emergencies. Um, but I did uh, understand, uh, I got a report on the testimony I missed, and I'll, I'll go back and, and watch it. Um, to Ms. Bray, I, I, I understand you raised some concerns. I, I, I didn't know the committee to hold it. I think this is a great report. I think it's very useful, moves us in the right direction. Uh, I, members don't always know what other committees are are, are doing, um, and um, so I, I'm not trying to hide the ball from you. And for the abatement fund, it's it's not been used, so um, that's probably why it hasn't come up in in our meetings. So my office, my staff, and I have met with uh, residents at Marbury uh, several times, uh, but just want to make sure you know I'm I'm not trying to hide the ball here. Um, so. The um, my first question is uh, for Ms. Osborne. You mentioned something in your testimony that I've heard from a couple public witnesses that uh, Department of Buildings should center tenant experience. Uh, you spoke uh, to some of that in your testimony, but can you lay out what, uh, in your in your opinion, that would look like? And then I'm going to get the perspective of residents to to see how that that might look as well. I mean, I think, thank you for the question. I think to understand tenant experiences with DOB's processes, first and foremost, DOB needs to be regularly communicating with tenants throughout the inspection process um, so that they can hear from them. If right now all the onus is on tenants to reach out to DOB and sometimes they're not getting through to people or they're when they do, for example, if they want to challenge whether or not their landlord has actually abated something, the landlord says they've abated, the it's fully on the tenant to, to contact DOB to tell them that. DOB is not having a conversation with the tenant about it. And then if the tenant does contact DOB, they're told they have to file it as a new complaint. So it's, it's about having meaningful conversations, understanding what tenants are going through, building in that com regular and automatic communication with them so that you're really aware of what tenants are going through and what the systemic problems people are facing are. And then also, I think, and this is in the committee's report, um, working in processes where DOB is engaging in focus groups or other opportunities to really hear directly from tenants. Uh, we really appreciate um, recently the DOB um, reached out to Children's Law Center 
and asked if we could maybe connect them with current or former clients to review um, a new for, uh, version of their online complaint form. And we would love to be able to do that. And we also hope that they'll be reaching out, not just to Children's Law Center, but to other legal service providers directly to tenants, to tenant uh, groups, so that they can be getting uh, input from a wide variety of, of places. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Thompson, and I appreciated your, your testimony. I think uh, there's agreement here, and I'm, I'm sure with the chairman as well. We, we don't want this hearing to to be or feel like a dog and pony show. What I hope you'll see is we, we, we're we trying to understand tenant experiences and also pushing agencies for answers so we can figure out where to go, because we don't know without your input, without asking questions to the agency. Um, from in, in your From your perspective, what would a a tenant focused DOB process look like? You mentioned a lot of serious concerns. What, what, what would it look like for DOB to function in a way that works for you as a tenant? Well, and just hearing your question for the first time, I think one avenue to addressing the concerns is to have a tenant representative on, on DOB, a resident. Not, not a government employee, but a resident on whatever committees or whatever investigation they conduct, they have a, a, a tenant representative in form. That will give a tenant a voice to speak truth to power. Right now, the tenant is on the back end of any investigation that's done, whether the problem is remediated or not, the tenant is the last to know. And, and in many instances, as we all know, that the, the uh, problems have not been corrected, even though the, the landlord or the, or the management company certifies they're corrected. The reality is, in many cases, those matters have not been corrected. If a tenant representative on that committee, on that team, there will be some feedback, there will be some accountability, there will be some a balance here. Right now, the committee is, is, is an imbalance. Um, now, when you say a tenant representative, um, one of the inspectors could be a tenant themselves somewhere else. Um, so I'm guessing you mean something more specific. Uh, and I like the idea, which is why I want to pull this thread a bit. What what type of tenant representative? I really haven't thought this through because you just asked, asked the question. Yeah, given a lot yeah. of thought and uh, you know, thought to it. But listen to your question. That's the first thing that popped in my mind as, yeah. as I'm talking about it. I'm more convinced now than before mm -hmm. that it's, it's, it's a good idea. How, what it would look like, what yeah. form that would take. I'm not certain about that because I'm, I'm not, that's not what I do, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm air expertise, but I think it's something that, to give, that something we take a look at to see how viable is that yeah, and, and what it would look like. Okay. Um, I, I'm over time already um, and I want to be able to pop out for a, a previously scheduled meeting and get back to question the agency. So I'm going to uh, pause there. Uh, and thank uh, this panel of public witnesses. If, if I may, I uh, know this hearing is in that close until February 1st. Must, uh, Mr. Mildeson? What's that? The hearing closes February 1st. The record closes on February 1st. I'm sorry, the record closes February yes. 1st. I can submit something, a proposal, what I think maybe yes. uh, fit into what I just outlined. Great. Yes, if you go to the council's website, you'll get the um, you'll get all of our email addresses, but also the uh, address to send uh, comments to the committee as a whole for this. Hearing. Thank you so much. I think you have to go to the hearing. You have options when you go to the council's website. And if you click on hearings, I think that's where you go. There's a hearing information management system, which is new. We called HIMS. And um, uh, that's where you'll see how you can submit. I can tell you my colleagues here and we come back and have with a more yeah. detailed suggestion or recommendation. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, each of you. I'll miss the so, chairman. Oh, I'm sorry. Council council Lewis, don't get up yet. Councilmember Lewis George. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you to this panel. Um, you know, I I want to say that uh, I hear many of the same concerns and frustrations from for, for residents um, and how landlords are able to renovate properties or buy new properties when they do pay fines or fix their existing conditions. Mr. Quayley, I want you to know I, I did introduce legislation um, called the Do Right by Tenants legislation in November um, to address housing issues we are seeing here in our community. 
where I think far too many tenants face unsafe and undignified housing conditions in their apartment buildings. Um, and, and right now, there's really nothing to stop landlords who profit by neglecting their buildings from buying up new rental properties and doing the same um, to even more tenants. Uh, the outcome is that tenants are forced to live in uninhabitable conditions while community safety t t deteriorates uh, for both tenants and the surrounding community. Um, my legislation would stop bad actor landlords from expanding their foothold in our community by, by denying new building permits and new businesses licenses from being issued to any individual or landlord that has five or more serious housing code violations in a 12-month period. Um, and it speaks to many of your concerns today. Um and because the question really is, where is the relief, relief for tenants who still have to pay rent, even though there is no hot water or mold? Um, I think it is it is unacceptable and we can do better. Um, and, you know, I, I say to everybody, we welcome housing providers to our city. We should welcome housing providers to our city. But we also need to send a clear message uh, that if you want to do business in D.C., you need to do right by our tenants. Um, and so that legislation is pending. Um, I think it's referred here to the Committee of the Whole um, I, I want to, I'm going to send out information to as many tenants as possible to get them to testify on behalf of that. But I just wanted you to know that, um, we did, I did put that legislation together, um, in consultation with tenants in Ward 4 who, who have reported the same, same issue. So I hope when it comes up, I will reach out to you and hope that you can come back and testify, um, in support of that legislation. Um, I want to ask to this panel, um, what are two or three things that the council and DOB should do immediately after this hearing? And that's open to the panel. You can, I see your hand first, Mr. Quayley, uh, but you can, so you can go first. Real fast. Um, thank you, Ms. George. Um, Ms. Lewis George. One thing that has still baffled me, given the egregious situation that are going on here at Marbury Plaza, and why hasn't, again, I proposed in my um, um, hearing, in my testimony, why hasn't the Department of Buildings um, began a, basically a property-wide inspection? Meaning, what they can spend a day or two coming here, but let's look at every single apartment. Because again, we keep going on these one-offs. And when they say, oh, this is fixed here, you have 10 over here that has never been or 10 over there that people don't know about or Department of Buildings don't know about. And because again, it is so egregious, it's now, you know, we've gone to bankruptcy. We're now in US, um, you, you, um, DC Superior Court where the judge has determined that people are living in uninhabitable conditions. That should automatically stem some sort of property-wide inspection of every unit, every common areas. For, so at least DOB will know the scope and span of what they're dealing with. That's all. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, it's open to the panel. Is there any other panelist who wants to to weigh in? Um, I hear a building wide inspection should be done immediately after this hearing to uh, inspect all uh, buildings and not just a one off one off properties. Are there any other suggestions uh, from this panel witness? Yes. And those of you who I can't see in person, feel free to okay. hop in. I just can't see you, so I oh, can't okay. point to you. My name is yeah. Montreal Hunter, and because we live in the old buildings. We're now being infestated with mice because of some rule that Verizon had to put down uh, bio, bi fiber optics or something. Now, one resident has trapped 16 mice in one week. And I just feel that th there needs to be some accountability. If I'm calling you to my unit, and you know there's an infestation, you need to go to all units. All right. Because Mickey going to run from my house to go to Minnie's house. He's not going to stay in my house. He's going to take the whole neighborhood with him. So yeah. if you're telling them they fix it, just like someone said about with the um, wire and the, the, the uh, silicone or whatever, that, that's not going to fix the problem. Yeah, got you. Know, you. So that's what we need to do. It, when they talk about the entire... The entire complex, not just one building. You're not, that's just like me stabbing you and you putting the bleachers. Absolutely. Thank you. And Ms. Phoenix, I see you. Yes. Um, it seems to me that a group of tenants who've complained within the last year could be um, polled and a focus group could be put together. Um, to really take a closer look at the complaint process. And you could look specifically at the complaints that those tenants have lodged within the last year 
and and what the resolution of those has been. And that would really, I think, point you in a direction or point the agency in a direction in terms of changes that might need to be made uh, in terms of the inspection complaint process and also the resolution of those complaints. Got it. Thank you. And Ms. Osborne. Thank you. I think quickly, some things that could be done immediately that I think council can ask DOB about at the hearing today are how, what are they doing to make their online form and their phone system accessible, both from a language and a technology uh, perspective? And what steps do they need to take to really to implement that? And also, what could what does DOB need to do? How could they communicate with tenants specifically when a landlord currently self certifies abatement online? Mm. Uh, that they are how can they affirmatively let tenants know that that's happening at the very least? Um, because obviously, we would ideally like to have them communicate with tenants more regularly. But in that particular instance, right now, tenants aren't notified. And that would, that's a huge, um, that's a huge problem for tenants. Got it. Thank you. Thank you to this panel. And I will follow up on those questions um, and those suggestions with DOB uh, when government witnesses are here. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lewis George. I do want to note, uh, we just, uh, the count, community of the whole and the council just adopted um, a proactive inspection bill that sets forth the uh, more rigorous parameters around uh, proactive inspection program. So that would not be complaint-based, but it would be somewhat analogous to the conversation that just took place about inspecting units in a building. What that uh, bill does is it says, depending upon the size of the building, a certain number of units, certain percentage of units would be inspected as part of a proactive inspection. And then if there are something like four class one violations, which are the most serious violations, the department, it's not, if I remember correctly, prescriptive as in the department shall inspect all 100, 100%, but it uh, clearly points in that direction. There's a challenge with inspecting all of the units because unless there's an immediate emergency, like a fire inside, uh, the department should get consent from tenants. It's a little bit shocking to me, but even in a building where there are a lot of complaints, not all tenants will consent. And if they don't consent, and they also have to have notice. So it's not like, uh, I'm going to ask you, um, I'm going to ask you uh, today for consent today so that I can inspect tonight or tomorrow. It's like there's more notice than that. So not only is it time consuming to get the consents, but actually a lot of tenants don't consent. And that makes it difficult for the um, agency to uh, inspect all of the units. Uh, this is one of the challenges we're looking at because I do see the value in, in where, where there are a lot of complaints or problems in a building, I see the value of inspecting all the units. Um, but it's it's easier said than done. I, you look like you want to respond. Yes. I understand what you're saying, but we're a new tenant association, right? And a lot of the people who live in that area are elderly people. Our buildings were sold up under us during pandemic. We had no knowledge. They said they were transferring it from one person to another. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I, I, I went and found a lawyer to find out what does that mean? And he said, they just, what they did was they did it undercover. They sold it without telling us. So what they did through the court system was saying they were transferring. So I'm asking him, what does that mean? He said, it's just like if you and I owned a building and we were, we were, we were partners and I come to you and say to you, I don't want it anymore. And I just give it to you, but that doesn't make good sense. Who's going to give somebody their money? So what they started doing was renovating, moving tenants from one unit to another to renovate, but they must have ran out of money. So most, as I said, most of the people who live on that block has been there 30 to maybe 40 years. They're seniors. They're scared they're going to be put out if they complain. And I keep trying to explain to them, they can't do that as long as you pay. But we know if someone comes to you and say you have no place to live, you paying this small amount of rent, knowing rents, how much it costs in DC, 
they're not going to say anything because they think they're going to lose their housing. I understand. I understand that that is a challenge here. But it does make me think, based on what you just said, you might, the Tenant Association might reach out to the Office of the Tenant Advocate and ask her to come out and meet with the, the, those residents, like meet in a, one of those buildings with a lot of seniors and uh, just explain what the rights are and answer questions. That might that might get them to be more involved. Just a thought. Uh, I took an extra minute. Councilmember White, did you have any follow up? Uh, no no follow up for uh, for this panel. As I said, I'm going to have to step out during the next panel, so I want to make sure uh, we can uh, keep going. Well, if it was anybody else, I would say no. Yes, Ms. Cooper. Sit down. Do you I need to be on the um my question is I understand y'all say y'all don't know what to do. But my thing is if we all work together, we can find a solution to the problem. DOB need to work directly with the tenants. I am the president of Marbury Plaza Tenant United. Everybody is not computerized. We got elderly people don't even know what a computer is. They can't put in no claims. So DOB need to start knocking on doors. It's a job. It's called a job. Now, we got people living there in Section A. And, and I'm one of them. And I'm proud of my Section A. I'm really, I appreciate that. God bless me to have a roof over top of my head. But at the end of the day, I don't know when the last time I seen HUD or any of them come out to do an inspection. So HUD should work with, with DOB, DOB should work with HUD, and all of them should work with the tenants. It's no way you could tell me that it's not a solution. It's a solution if we all work together. Period. It's not going to work if we don't work together. Fair point. Ms. Cooper, before you leave, yes, we have got to work together. Now, I'm going to continue to shoot straight with, with you all. You can continue to be frustrated with me, but we've got to find a space where we can have conversations. I can say, I don't think this is going to work, and you tell me you think it will, but what I want you to understand, I'm not working against you. I'm trying to work with you. That doesn't mean you're always going to like what I have to say, but I do want to be straight up with you. So I, I want to make sure this is a two-way thing. We have got to work together because right now I'm trying to tiptoe around because I you know, I, I don't want y'all to be more upset. It's not, it's not making us work quicker. It's making us work more slowly. Um, my staff is all the way in this trying to figure it out. I'm all the way in this trying to figure it out. But we've got to have a space where we can have more constructive conversations than what we've been having. And that's what I want. That's what I want. But at the end of the day, the tenants are the community. You're right. We You're living make, in this. We make, yes. we make it work. But my thing is, if you not go to the table and you make a decisions for my life or where I live at and I'm not, you know, involved in that decision, I got a problem with that. I got a problem with other people coming in they don't live in my shoes. They don't know the struggle we have been through. So you can't talk for me or my people. We can talk for ourselves. Find out what we need, what we want. And if you work with us, I guarantee you, we'll work with you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cooper. Uh, so that's going to conclude the testimony from this panel. I want to thank each of the witnesses. Going to turn to the next group of witnesses. Antoinette Lawson, Shanta Rodriguez, who's with Franklin Arms Tenants Association, Giordano Hardy Turena, who's an organizer with Homes for All DC, Brenda Lee Richardson, who's a coordinator with Anacostia Parks and Community Collaborative, Kiara Colon Torres, Edward Daniels, who's chair of ANC 8F, Kati P Peter, who's with AOBA, Harrison Miller, who's Director of Residential Operations with Gelman Management Company, and Greg Selfridge, who's Managing Partner of Novo Properties.
Antoinette Lawson. Isn't it? Don't see her. Yes. Santo Antoinette Lawson. I see you. Okay. <laughs> Please proceed. Okay, um, my name is Antoinette Lawson. Um, I'm a senior citizen. I live at 114 Wayne Place, Southeast, apartment 401. Uh, and it's a senior building, privately owned. And um, our building is having lots of problems. We've just been organized maybe uh, since last September as a, as a council, um, a tenants association, and our building is falling apart. The building is not that old. I've been living there since uh, 2017. And the building was a beautiful building. It still is in its way, but it's falling apart brick by brick. I'm sure everything went from what I'm reading on, on the computer, what I've said, we, I'm ha we're having a problem with our landlord. Everything is just happening. I haven't. Um, I had a case. I won my case before COVID, um, right as COVID started. Um, and I've been complaining and I filed complaints since uh, 2017. I haven't had anything done in my apartment. No inspections, no corrections. I have bed bugs. I have um, mites, the pink mites that they come in from outside, they fly in from outside. I have uh, my carpet is, is terrible. I've fallen on it twice. And all I, I wanted to make this to, as quick as possible for you. You name it, that's going wrong in an apartment. More than likely, I have it. I'm the vice president of our tenants association and uh, it's St. Paul Senior Living. It's owned by um, a church in uh, Maryland. And we have nobody in the office. That, that, uh, I can't ring, ring my, uh, my bell to allow anybody to come in. I have to go downstairs. I live on the fourth floor. It's just getting, month by month, it's getting horrendous. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lawson. Shanta Rodriguez? Hi, good everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Council, and I thank you for your time today. My name is Shanta Rodriguez. I am the president of the Franklin Arms Tenant Association, along as well as a member of the Homes for All organization, as well as 1DC. I come to you today <laughs> from um, displaced from my home once again. I have been pursuing the assistance of the Department of Buildings, formerly DCRA, since two years after I moved to the Franklin Arms. In this time frame, I have complained every year seasonally about water entering through multiple light fixtures. I have complained about mold. I have complained about security. I have complained about so many things to the point now we had an inspector come out last week and um you know it's already discerning when you you are reaching out to our agencies and our councilmen and, and the first response is well you know this isn't just your building it's across the city. Um that doesn't make me feel better to know that I'm not and we're not the only ones suffering. It makes it wide eye to say, okay, so if it's not just us, this is across the city, that should be a red flag. That should be an alarm. We're the nation's capital. Um, we have had our water turned off at least five times since the beginning of the year. And when our water is on, it's not clear. Our water is murky, milky gray. I don't know who wants to drink that? But me, I don't. And I don't want to serve it to my animals. I don't want to serve it to my family. Who wants that to touch their skin? And each incident that we bring to our property manager, it's an instance where we are somehow wanting to have these issues in our home or because someone has an animal they've created mold or because someone has... Um, a couch too many in their apartment that they've created water damage. So what can be done when the DOB inspector comes and you lead them on a common area tour and you show them the fifth floor with multiple cracks, with multiple attempts to correct water damage where the ceiling is indented and coming in. When you show them in the lobby, there's water bubbles in the stairwells and the inspector turns to you and says, well, until these ceilings actually collapse, there's nothing we can do for you. 
So once the ceilings collapse and everyone's trapped in their homes or the building collapses, then what? The same inspector thought it was okay to tell me that, you know, if you've been complaining all of this time, you might as well just move because they're not gonna fix it if they haven't fixed it in all of this time. So what actually are you wanting from us? We can't make them fix the problem. So what do you want from us? And I was put in contact with the DOB because like someone said, their, their mission statement to help me. I, I help lead a building of 55 units. Half of this building has been vacant for over a year. We're preparing for Topo. We don't know what to prepare for. But in the meantime, as someone else said, I'm displaced from my unit again. And there are repairs being made in my unit, but it's not mediating the mold. It's not mediating the water that's coming in from the fifth floor on the 07 line, on the 04 line, on the 01 line, that, that is going to be coming back soon as I go to my unit. You know, I couldn't even have my property manager work in a professional manner and put me in a place that I requested. So when DOB tells you give up and move on, we're already hopeless. I already have medical conditions. I already see my neighbors who have moved out and still getting taken to court who called me and have had nervous breakdowns and I can't do anything. So someone mentioned mental health, it deteriorates everything. So I reiterate, if the DOB inspector tells me there's nothing that they can do, what do I want and I need to move? What's going on? I digress. Thank you for your time today. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. Uh, Giordano Hardy Trena. Hi, thank you and good afternoon, uh, Chairman and members of this committee. My name is Giordano Hardy Herrera. I am a Ward 8 resident and tenant organizer with 1DC. 1DC is the local anchor for the National Homes for All campaign led by Right to the City. 1DC's Homes for All DC campaign consists of working class tenant associations. Together, we aim to build the capacity of existing DC-based tenant associations and to push for a political sea change with respect to housing justice in the district. Currently, Homes for All DC consists of four tenant associations in wards five and eight. Collectively, this represents over 197 households. We are ever expanding or in the process of incorporating an additional four tenant associations in the coming months. We all agree the housing code inspection process is failing. The recommendations in the re report begin to strengthen this process, but need to go further to ensure the safety and well-being of tenants in DC, especially mm -hmm. those who are working class who are hardest hit by slumlord practices. Many tenants need to request inspections, however few do. Of the few tenants who are courageous enough to do so, many end up with zero fixes to their maintenance issues or at best superficial repairs. This needs to change. When tenants take the time to find the request inspections, they need to be met with a process that will actually protect their right to dignified housing. The committee understands this need. For instance, the report that you published recommends moving from virtual to in-person reinspections. This would be a marked improvement. However, other recommendations fall short. For instance, when it comes to ensuring violations are resolved, the report suggests nudging landlords. Nudging would only increase compliance by 14.7%. This low level of additional compliance is worrisome, given how widespread landlord non-compliance is in the district. The report also recommends that the Department of Buildings file non-responsive notices of infractions with the Office of Administrative Hearings within 25 days or less. While this would be an improvement over the status quo, this is too wide a grace period in which tenants might suffer unreasonable living conditions for nearly a month. Homes for All DC tenant leaders believe the inspections process, if it's to be amended, needs to include stricter consequences for landlords who are, not, who are in non-compliance with DC's housing code. They have identified three recommendations. Number one, if landlords have unresolved or unabated violations, they should be unable to evict tenants. Number two, 
If landlords have unresolved violations, they should not be able to collect emergency um, assistance program funds. Number three, if landlords have unresolved violations or have too many violations in a given time period, they should not be able to renew their business license. We hope the committee takes these three goals into consideration. Homes for All DC has been meeting with council persons and their staff to discuss these goals and helps to meet with even more as soon as possible. We are working closely with Denise Lewis George to include these goals in her do right by the DC Tenants Amendment Act of 2023. Ultimately, Homes for All DC is encouraging this committee to strengthen the inspections process by considering greater deterrence for violations of the housing code. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. Brenda Lee Richardson. Thank you, um, Chairman Mendelson, and please forgive me for missing your earlier um, hearing. Uh, yes, my I name is. Get, I did get your statement for the earlier hearing. Okay. But I don't have a statement from you for this hearing. Oh well, I'll I'll be happy to send it in. All right. I knew you thank, would. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my name is Brenda Lee Richardson. I'm a Ward 8 resident and coordinator of the Anacostia Parks and Community Collaborative. Now the DOB is under the leadership of Brian Hanlon. I am confident that there will be change. When APAC discovered that many public housing residents in Washington Highland went through the sweltering heat this past summer with no air conditioning, we were appalled and wanted to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Having a safe place to live is at the center of our ability to live healthy, dignified lives. But too many of our neighbors are living in buildings that are riff with hazards from pests and mold to pollutants from fossil fuel, burning appliances, and lack of air conditioning during summer heat waves. Combined with the affordable housing shortage in our area means that many families and individuals with limited income have little choice but to live in housing that is not up to code. This hearing is an important step toward addressing our problematic housing code inspection process. At the council's own investigation and report found, the built environment can profoundly impact physical and mental health and recognizes how the lack of cooling systems increases the risk of experiencing heat stroke. But reducing delays in serving notices and nudging property owners to address violations before inspections are initiated cannot be a replacement for stepping up enforcement when property managers who are unresponsive to the health and safety needs of the people living in their buildings. Finally, there is also the complicated maze of agencies, inspectors, and regulations that one must navigate to have a maintenance issue resolved. APAC supports Council Member Mendelssohn's proactive inspection bill and the creation of the Department of Buildings following the recent breakup of DCRA. However, more educational and community outreach services are needed to keep renters and those folks in public housing more informed about current and new policies involving property maintenance and their rights to live in a safe building. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Richardson. Uh, Kiara Colon Torres, who I think is not here. Edward Daniels, who I think is not here. Kati Peter. Hello. Hello. Okay, great. Good afternoon, Chairman and staff. My name is Catalan Peter. I am the Vice President of Government Affairs for the Apartment and Office Building Association of Metropolitan Washington, D.C. We thank the committee for what I believe was phrased as investigative research um, for DOB and the code inspection process. From our perspective, these recommendations and the work that's gone into it have been the greatest amount of effort put into this process in the last 15 years or so. Our main priority as an association, we represent approximately 1,000 member companies who are managing over 100,000 
homes throughout the district, all eight wards. Um, we do not represent every single housing provider in the district. So my comments are limited to those of our members and the best practices of our members. Um, our main priority again is the health and safety of all of our residents. I'm going to use my time to specifically make a couple comments on the recommendations um, within the report. We'll also have two of my members um, who are going to discuss an issue that I believe was somewhat raised today with regards to accountability. Um, we believe that housing providers and tenants should all be have a level of accountability in ensuring that our communities are safe, healthy places to live. Um, and our members will have a couple of specific examples of something we would like to see addressed um, within the recommendations of the report as well um, to ensure that accountability across the board. Um, as far as the recommendations go, um, we do believe that the amount of time you set in the report for notices uh, is very important with regards to scheduling. We know Keith Parsons and his team, uh, Director Hanlon, have been working with many of our members on and offline about fixing the scheduling process to make sure that our housing providers, when properly notified of something that's going on at one of their properties, do have that time to abate um, when our member companies don't have sufficient notice or communication, or as was addressed in the report, information is going to an expired address or to um, perhaps an attorney representing the building, um, these repairs aren't able to be made in a timely manner because there isn't notice. Um, we have to work very extensively in terms of scheduling our maintenance staff, um, particularly some issues which require much more technical expertise. Um, we need to make sure we have all of those staff um, on site. So the more notice, um, the more we can have a role in scheduling, uh, the better. Then the other item was, it's clear in the report that you are prioritizing more training for personnel. We hope that in the budget, you will also prioritize this. Um, we have definitely seen many inspectors who have um, worked with our members and you hear one thing from one inspector, one thing from another. So I think that having that consistent um, process throughout is going to be helpful. Um, alternative resolution of infractions. Um, this is, every building is not the same when you have naturally occurring affordable housing buildings, which are over a hundred years old. I think a couple have been discussed or you have newer buildings. There needs to be a level of humanity and flexibility um, and also practicality in if the housing provider is being responsive um, and they're doing everything they can to make certain um, improvements or fixes, um, that, they, that they are able to work flexibly and practically. I don't think I'm articulating this correctly, but I think often we find that in the past, we've it, there hasn't been much room to work with the inspectors. So we hope that this can be more flexible. Um, and I would like to know, um, Council Member Lewis George mentioned um, do right by our tenants. We are committed to doing right by our tenants um, every step of the way. Um, and the more that we can continue to work with DOB and the team over there um, to ensure that if there is an infraction, um, that we are duly notified of it, we have the proper time and opportunity to abate. Um, and if there are access issues, which my members will describe, um, that we have we can do something about that as well, because if we can't have access to certain units or properties, we simply are unable to make the timely repairs. Thank you. I went over my time, happy to answer any questions and we'll also be submitting more detailed comments with specific notes on each of the recommendations. Uh, thank you for that last point, because we don't have a statement from you, so we'll be getting it. In fact, don't have a statement from anybody in this group of witnesses. So um, it's always helpful to have the statements. And uh, so I encourage everyone to get us their statements. Um, Harrison Miller. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Harrison Miller and I'm the director of residential operations for Gelman management company, a small private landlord has been operating in the district of Columbia for nearly 100 years. I want to first say that I understand and share the frustration of many of the tenants that provided testimony today. 
Um, the topic of today's hearing not only affects the living conditions of individual residents, as we've heard, but also poses a significant challenge to housing providers striving to maintain safe and habitable homes for our community. In my opinion, a key issue exacerbating our housing code enforcement system is that there's a lack of accountability on the part of a select, perhaps few tenants that create housing code violations. Many code violations arise when problem tenants, in some cases intentionally or repeatedly, create conditions that not only jeopardize their own well being, but also that of their neighbors and the community at large. Uh, an example that we run into that's been touched on today is when tenants maintain their apartment in unsanitary conditions, fostering an environment conducive to rodent or pest infestations. These problems not only compromise the health and safety of the tenant themselves, but can have a major ripple effect on neighboring residents. Unfortunately, the hands of housing providers are tied when it comes to addressing these issues effectively. If a tenant is unable or unwilling to implement strict housekeeping procedures and effectively limit food sources for rodents, no pest control technique will be effective. Rodents and pests know no boundaries and will quickly spread to neighboring apartments and throughout the community, despite those residents' best efforts to maintain a clean environment. How can a landlord accept responsibility when they have no way to control the situation and the process of removing a tenant for housekeeping violations could take many, many months through the current process, if even achievable? It's essential to emphasize the importance of accountability for all parties involved in the housing process. While landlords have a responsibility to provide safe and well-maintained housing, tenants must also be held accountable for their actions that may lead to housing code violations. We need comprehensive reforms that empower landlords with the tools necessary to enforce housing standards, while also ensuring that tenants are aware of their responsibilities. There must be measures in place to address tenants that either intentionally or consistently create housing code violations the same way that there are measures in place to penalize landlords that consistently violate code. Too much emphasis, in my opinion, is placed on trying to catch the few bad actor housing providers in the district while burdening the majority of law-abiding landlords with excessive fees, lengthy inspections, and an unjust process. I think if we all work towards a solution that holds everyone accountable and creates a system that is fair, efficient, and promotes the well-being of our communities, that, that's something that's achievable. And happy to answer any questions, and I plan on submitting my testimony after the hearing. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, Greg Selfridge? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today at the public oversight hearing on the rental housing inspection process, broken and need in repair, a need of repair. My name is Greg Selfridge. I'm with Novo Properties. Novo is a mid-sized property management company that is located in and has been managing property in, for 20 years in Washington, D.C. To be clear at the outset, there are bad actors in the district that need stringent enforcement actions. However, there are also well-intentioned housing providers that are getting caught up in the dragnet. To summarize a problem with the process from the housing provider's perspective, there is a broken and unaccountable notice system to the housing provider. The lack of a cure period for any violations that are noted. There is no responsibility or obligation for a tenant to first notice the housing provider about any violation. There is no ability or enforcement mechanism to compel a tenant to actually provide access to the housing provider to fix the violation. I think you actually referenced that yourself when you spoke about the Marbury Plaza and inspecting every unit. And there's an absolute lack of recognition that some violations are a direct result of a tenant's misuse or abuse of a living unit. For a housing provider to be pulled into an NOI resolution and appeal process is to start in a highly disadvantaged position due to the strict liability a housing provider has to cure any and all housing code violations. This liability does not consider that the housing code provider in many cases does not have knowledge of such violation and the tenant must be a willing participant to resolve any issues. This is in addition to the inability of the housing inspectors to differentiate from tenant caused damage 
and repair and maintenance items, which are the result of expected wear and tear in an old building. You have to start with the recognition that minor housing code violations are everywhere. They are in my house, they may be in your house. They are particularly prevalent in the 100-year-old housing stock that is present throughout the city. Some of the most common ones you may find are a smoke detector that is too close to a ceiling van or vent, or a wall or ceiling imperfection that is a natural characteristic of plaster walls. Maybe a closet door swells in the winter and doesn't fully latch due to the fact that it's painted many times over its lifespan. These are in addition to the constant and more acute repair and maintenance items that are required on buildings of this age with old plumbing and electrical systems and masonry, which has been weathered through the decades. What happens is that DOB comes out in sites of violation. DOB would seem to have zero discretion to note a violation is caused by a tenant or its guests. So a housing provider gets fined the same way for a leaking pipe as it does for a hole being kicked in an interior door by an occupant or visitor to that unit. Maybe the housing provider gets noticed, maybe it doesn't. But let's assume one receives notice, then it is fully dependent on the tenant granting access to the housing provider to make the repair. I have many examples of this dynamic, but in the interest of time, I have not included them in my testimony. I would welcome the opportunity to meet with council staff and share examples of this dynamic in play. In one building in Northeast DC, the housing provider was compelled to file a temporary restraining order with the court to compel access to multiple apartments to make repairs. This access was denied while at the same time, DOB was being called out to cite the housing provider for violations. To be clear, the filing of the TRO alone was not enough to gain access. The housing provider actually had to go to court and stand in front of a judge before the tenant attorney would agree to grant access. While not every situation is as stark an example as this, the fundamental problem in the process is that the liability and responsibility is 100% on the housing provider. The tenant has no accountability for damaging the unit, acting in bad faith, or denying access for repairs. As a matter of fact, in the non-payment of rent case, a tenant and its advocates may be motivated to work in bad faith because it bolsters a case for rent relief, landlord sanctions, or other benefits to their legal case. Thank you for the time you allowed me today, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Selfridge. So I'll reiterate, um, statements are encouraged and welcome, and please everyone give us uh, copies of your statements. Um, I think I wanted to ask a few questions of um, the landlords, Ms. Peter. The uh, report talks about, um, I think 56% of the notices didn't get to the provider. Is that consistent with your understanding or yes. is it greater or less? I think that's effectively consistent. And I, how far back, I forget, does the report back? How many years does it go back? I think it's 2022. Okay. I, I think in, again, in the past year, we may have seen some additional improvements as DOB um, is working under their new authority. Um, but within the past 10 or 15 years, I think that that's effectively been consistent. Is that over half of the notices aren't being received or they're received months later or they're sent to the wrong person? Uh, my other question for you is uh, there was some testimony with the previous round of witnesses about the fines. Um, as I recall, there were tenants who said, you know, these conditions are horrible and we have to suffer through them. And why are the fines abated? You know, if the landlord abates the, uh, I mean, I think one of the challenges here, and I'm going to get to this in a minute, maybe with Mr. Miller and Mr. Selfridge is that there are many ways of parsing, but one way is that we have good landlords and bad landlords and good landlords are acting in good faith and bad landlords aren't. We only have one system and that is we have one housing code. Um, and I don't know that we can really uh, make distinctions. Um, so what's your view on the fines? Is it if a, tenant, if a tenant's putting up with a horrible condition, should the landlord not have to pay a penalty? 
I, I think before you can get to fines and penalties, that seems like the absolute last part of the process. You have to ensure that the process is in fact it, it doing what it should be, that housing providers are given plenty of notice. They receive that sufficient notice. And if they are choosing not to abate within a reasonable time, then I think you can discuss what the fine and how the fine structure should be. That seems like putting the cart before the horse, if that's a proper analogy. I think fines are absolutely the last thing that needs to be addressed. I think it's to ensure that the process is... is uh, all right, so there's a tenant who complains about uh, mice in their apartment. Okay. I, I think what you're saying makes sense. There's a tenant, in fact, several who complain about how no heat in their building. And actually, there was no heat last month for a week, and there was no heat last winter for a week or several weeks. Um, in that case, um, the landlord knows if there's no heat or the landlord should know. And if the if this, this is a chronic problem with the property, the landlord should certainly know that there's problems with the boiler system. So shouldn't then the fine be more punitive? Have you identified the exact criteria of how long they've known? What is the definition of chronic? What is, you know, is it, is how, how long is reasonable for that fix to be made and, and has a, someone working in, in pretty much standard course of business, um, gone below that threshold or, and, and not, I mean, I think, I think it's a matter of determining, okay, this is an adequate response. This is an above and beyond response. And this is a poor poor response. But until you determine what counts as a poor response in that situation, how do you know what the fines are? So I'd like to know what what would count as an adequate response by the housing provider, what counts as adequate notice from DOB, and then you assess. You know, they, they have been given adequate notice and they have performed very poorly in that situation. Then yes, the fine should be punitive because they've they've gone below what's considered. Um, and Greg Harrison, you I mean, you are, you are the, the managers. Does that stem with you? Well, actually, let me turn to the two providers, yeah. Mr. Miller and Mr. Selfridge. So how do you respond to what I was just pressing? So uh, I'll allow Greg to speak as well, I guess, but in my opinion, um, a lot of it has to do with uh, good faith and intention. So, you know, obviously if there's a systemic or chronic, as you called it, problem with, with heating, then, you know, a, a good faith landlord would take action after they've, you know, come to that conclusion and look into replacing the heating system. But um, there's so many things involved in that, that that's not something that can be accomplished obviously in, you know, a week or a month, um, you know, forget all the legislation and regulation that we need to kind of get our arms around when we're replacing a heating system, keeping BEPS in mind, you know, the permitting process, where you're going to vent new equipment, stuff like that. But also the lead times. Uh, in, in our case, we have a boiler that we ordered for a building that's now been over a year that we're waiting for it because of the lead time. And um, I think as long as there's showing of good faith that the landlord's trying to make this problem better and fix the problem and in the interim do the best with what they have in place, um, I, I think that's reasonable. If there's someone that's continually getting cited and not acting in good faith and can show you that they're making progress and aren't driving towards a solution, but maybe even the opposite and trying to force people out because of this, um, then I think, yeah, there should be fines and there should be hefty fines. Yeah, but I once think we have those metrics, I think, to determine that you've gone below those metrics, which are generally within um, the industry considered as good faith. And I think DOB can be helpful in that. I think they know as well, technically, you know, these actions are in good faith um, versus if you're falling just poorly below that. 
I, I think I think there also is a distinction on the type of issue that you're dealing with. So a rodent problem, for example, uh, I mean, given the climate we're in and the, the elevation we're in, there's a lot of rodents in this city. Um, we have been very successful at fixing rodent issues when we have cooperation of the tenants. If you don't have cooperation from tenants, it is impossible essentially and we've met and consulted with numerous pest control companies and if there's a food source there there's not much you can do to stop it we can plug every hole with steel wool we can take all kinds of other corrective actions but at the end of the day it's gonna they're gonna keep coming back and they're gonna go into other units so i think that's a really difficult one um the heating example, I think there are times where something breaks and there's not enough redundancy and you need to get a part in. And until you get that part in, there's not much that you can do. Now, we do everything we can to make sure we have redundancy and that we have spare parts on hand. But um, as Greg alluded to, some of these systems are in buildings that are, you know, 100 plus years old and they can't necessarily take what's on the shelf. Um, even if you modernize them, it's not always a one for one. What do you mean? It's not always a one for one, meaning you may not be able to take whatever the newest system is and put that in a hundred year old building. You may need to continue working on a somewhat older technology because of the way the building is piped or because of the way the building was constructed. Um, a lot of the buildings from, you know, 80 to 180 years ago are two pipe systems. So they have essentially either providing cooling or heating. They cannot provide both. You cannot exchange that and, you know, have a four pipe system put in without immense cost and disruption to residents. So um, I'm spending a little bit of time here because it's the end of the panels. Um, and I'm the only one here, so I get to change the rules. The um, I, I think the good faith is a good point, but you know the way regulations work best is if they're objective. That is, there's a bright line rather than subjective. That's why I say metrics. Is you need to have those metrics, which are the quantifiable of that subjective what good faith is. We need to we need to find what those metrics are objectively. Um, and I do think that DOB has the expertise. I think that housing providers have the expertise. And I think to a certain extent, a tenant can make a relatively um, fair um, assessment of, okay, this housing provider does seem like they are, what those metrics are. Oh, I don't know. Because I think some of the landlords, I'm thinking of Marbury Plaza, have worked hard at trying to game the system. Well, sir, I believe that that's, that is, that does not account for the whole system. That's, that, that's where I say we do need flexibility and to be pragmatic is yeah. that if you have an actor who's, I mean, this is not, everything is not entirely, everyone is not objectively the same. Everyone is not good faith. Let me ask Mr. Selfridge, Selfridge, um, how do we guarantee access? I have no idea, but well, it is a major problem that we face. And let me tell you, Mr. Chairman, some people just don't want you in their unit. They would, correct. and I'm the same way, like look around your house. I live on Capitol Hill. I know you live on Capitol Hill. And I look around my house like ahead of this hearing and when I think about these issues and I have a crack in my ceiling or I have, uh, that's probably bad, maybe a closet door doesn't close all the way. And do I want to bring somebody in and, tarp my house and get drywall dust and the paint and all the di and all the disruption that comes with it. And what, sometimes I don't, I just live with it. You may be the same way, you may be different, but a lot of the tenants are the same way. And so some people just don't want to be bothered by it and they don't want to be brought in and have you in their unit. And this is a problem with the proactive inspections, which I know we're not talking about today, but I can't force my way into somebody's unit. There's also a real human factor here. It's really, really hard to hire and staff people on these buildings. They're difficult to work on. They're hundred year old buildings. And some of these relationships between landlords and tenants can be contentious. That's just, it's the nature of being a landlord in the district of Columbia. 
And if I send a maintenance man to somebody's door and they tell them to, to go away, pound sand or worse, then guess what? My ability to do work in that unit just became exponentially harder. And so these are the real world challenges that we're facing. It gets lost in the in the reports and the white papers and kind of the best practices. But at the end of the day, we need to be able to get in there and work on these units. We need to be aware that there's a problem. We have to have willingness of tenants to work with us to resolve these problems. And if not, we have strict liability to fix it and DOB doesn't care. And guess what? Here's a $2,200 fine, buddy. Go fight it with OAH. That stinks. With well, I'm, I'm willing to look for an alternative but I don't know what it is. I mean, what's going through my mind right now is the testimony from the, I think she said she was president of the Nash Place Tenant Association, close to a hundred units. And she said the seniors don't want to complain with problems like heat because they're afraid they're gonna be evicted. Um, or yeah, I guess evicted. Maybe she didn't say evicted, but the landlord would make life I, unpleasant. I, 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 that's not Mr. even possible. I, Mr. Chairman, I don't know how to work with that. Like, I understand and I, I appreciate people's sentiment, but I don't know how to work with that. And like, I don't either. Yeah. That, well, what can I do? And so you said that a, a, a system, if I can go backwards a little bit, needs to be objective. I, maybe in a perfect world, but there is some subjectiveness here. I think the good faith standard is a critical standard. If people are trying to fix an issue and working in good faith, I, I had my boiler at my house on Capitol Hill went down last month. And I called my plumber out and he came out three or four different times to replace different parts because he couldn't quite figure it out. So I didn't have heat for about two weeks. And I put space heaters in my house and it was a hassle, but it was just the nature of it. That feels to me like that's a good faith effort to fix the problem. And had I been a, a renter in that building and I'd been acting in the same manner, should I be getting fined for bringing out plumbers and doing my best to fix this problem? Does that advance the cause of improving the housing stock in the District of Columbia? Fair point. Uh, did Mr. Miller, did you speak up or was it Ms. somebody spoke up? Oh, I see a hand up. Mr. Hardy Trena. Hi, yes. I just wanted to weigh in a little bit on this conversation we're having about tenants letting um, folks into their apartment to, to fix things. I think it's quite ironic that today we have Mr. Selfridge on the panel right. representing Nova Properties when there are several tenants, actually three buildings that we're working with that are under Novo properties that are struggling with maintenance issues. Um, to give an example of a resident who lives there, she was woken up without any notification at 8 a.m. to have repairs done on her apartment. She let them in. Was she upset about that? Yes. Are most people gonna be willing to accommodate being given no notice and being disturbed at the last minute? Of course not. We also have to assess whether or not these problems that are being lobbied by landlords are actually real. A lot of what's in the report is evidence-based. These claims that tenants are not willing to let folks access their apartments are, for all intents and purposes, hearsay. Is that an actual issue? I would actually like that substantiated if we're talking about objective metrics. How many people who are going through the hassle of requesting inspections are then being unwilling to have access um, for maintenance into their apartments. How many of their neighbors who are probably suffering similar conditions are just simply unwilling to have access to their apartments? Yeah. Or is it the case that they're not being given enough notice or they're being in the notice in the middle of the day when they're too busy working or it's too last minute or giving no notice at all? I think that we need to really assess whether these claims are legitimate or just very thin veneers for folks like someone on this call to operate um, in ways that violate the housing code repeatedly. Mr. Chairman, the problem is the personal attacks continue to come at us and they're not productive to try to solve these problems. And so we can all say that these things don't happen, that they're hearsay, that they're not realistic. But I can tell you that uh, we are working hard to fix these notices. And I'll be happy to submit the temporary restraining order, which I had granted to get access to a unit so I could make the repairs. Part of the problem, which I don't want to go into today, was that the uh, allegation of a housing code violation is an affirmative defense and a non-payment of rent case. And so there are motivations out there. I'm not applying it to everybody out there, but to think that, the, that, 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 that there's not some games that get played within this very complex system that we have in the District of Columbia would be to not have an honest uh, recognition of where we are. And, and I'm asking not to get involved in a back and forth. Uh, I came on this panel to provide a perspective that I think is a valuable perspective and is 
probably not offered enough because of the concern about people speaking out publicly, but I'm trying to find solutions to the problems as well. Well, I do want to note that uh, I brought up the testimony from the um, uh, the woman who is the president of the Nash Place Tenants, and she was the one who said, but it was on a proactive basis. It wasn't a complaint-based um, report on a proactive basis that uh, tenants are hesitant to uh, get involved. So, yeah, we have a lot of rental units and therefore a lot of different kinds of conditions. Uh, anything else that anybody wants to say before I dismiss you all? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, in our experience, and I've been with the company about 10 years, what Greg is commenting on actually does happen. And it happens with much more frequency than you'd realize. Um, but what also happens with much more frequency is that we have tenants that create housing code violations for those that live around them, above them, and below them. And that could mean consistently overflowing their tubs so that the water is leaking into the unit below them, or, you know, as I mentioned in other examples with pests. And for me, that's a really challenging one to deal with because we're getting cited by DOB for the unit below because <clears throat> the unit above continues to overflow their tub and there's not action we can take with any expeditious fashion to stop that individual from doing that or from, you know, living in their apartment in a way that makes things dangerous, whether that's creating mold, um, pests, water issues, the list goes on. So th that's another nut that I think needs to be cracked. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank each of the witnesses. Again, reminder, submit your testimony, your statements. Um, so you all are excused. And I feel like taking about a, um eight-minute break to 2.55, and then the government. So it's 2.47. We'll recess for eight minutes. I know that sounds odd, but 2.55. Oh, I'm sorry. Councilmember Lewis, George, did you have any questions? No, I didn't. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, so we will come back at 2.55.
I'm, I'm here for a purpose and I'm ready whenever you are, Chairman. So I'm reconvening this uh, hearing. This is an oversight hearing on the district's housing code inspection process and the time is three o'clock. We have Mr. Keith Parsons at the table. If you have a statement, why don't you give the statement? Good afternoon, Chairman Mendelson, Chair Lewis George, Council Member Fruman, Council Member Robert White, staff and members of the public. I am Keith David Parsons, the Strategic Enforcement Administrator at the Department of Buildings, and I'm delighted to join you this afternoon to discuss the important work done by the Office of Residential Inspections, or ORI. This office is part of the larger Office of Strategic Code Enforcement and reports through me to DOB Director Brian Hanley. My comments today represent a truncated version of the written testimony that I've submitted to Council. First, I would like to thank the chairs for convening this hearing. The work of the residential inspections team is a crucial piece of DOB's larger mission to maintain a safe and dynamic built environment within the District of Columbia and to serve and protect our residents. Similarly, the work of this agency is just one crucial piece of the larger work of other district agencies, the council and our partners and customers, the tenants, occupants and housing providers of the district. This work is a complicated collaboration of many moving parts and I look forward to providing more insight into DOB's portions of the regulatory structure during this hearing today. Before we delve into the specific issues of focus for this hearing, let me reiterate that DOB will continue to, under the leadership of Director Hanlon, focus on clarity, communication, and collaboration. We will continue to look for ways to make our processes clearer and more accessible. Additionally, we will continue to elevate the level of our communication to achieve better outcomes. Lastly, we will look for ways to more effectively collaborate with our sister agencies and external stakeholders to achieve the outcomes we agree are essential. DOB's Office of Residential Inspections has a challenging but vital role in the ecosystem of housing regulation, and that is making sure existing occupied properties are maintained by their owners according to the Housing and Property Maintenance Codes. As the name of the program suggests, most of this work is focused on properties that are used as homes, apartments, condominiums, and individual houses. However, the property maintenance code also applies to commercial and mixed use properties. While much of the program's work is done on behalf of tenants and rental units, DOB can also cite violations on owner-occupied property. There are two important markers of this program's focus. First, our team focuses on existing completed buildings. This distinction is important because buildings that are under construction are handled by the illegal construction program. Secondly, it focuses on occupied buildings. Vacant buildings are handled by the vacant and blighted property program. Within this focus on completed occupied buildings, the Office of Residential Inspections conducts three different types of inspections, basic business license inspections, proactive inspections, and complaint-based inspections, the last of which is the primary focus of this testimony and today's hearing. When a property owner wants to start the business of renting their property, First, they must secure a basic business license, or BBL, from the Department of Licensing and Consumer Protection, or DLCP. DLCP is the sister agency of DOB that was created on October 1st, 2022, when the former Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs, or DCRA, was split into two separate entities. Before DLCP will issue a BBL to a property owner, DOB's Office of Residential Inspections must conduct an inspection to ensure the property meets minimum standards for rental use. These inspections look for a certain limited set of issues to make sure that tenants in the property will be safe and comfortable. Until these issues are addressed, the property does not pass inspection and the BBL will not be issued. 
Once the property passes inspection, DOB provides the owner with a document that can be presented to DLCP so they can move forward in the licensing process. Later, if the conditions of the property deteriorate, ORI can conduct an inspection at the tenant's request. These are commonly referred to as complaint-based inspections. Tenants are required by law to first inform their landlord and management company about the issues. If the landlord or management company fails to remediate the complaints, ORI will send a team member to inspect the property and identify any issues that are violations of the housing or property maintenance code. Any violations identified are memorialized in a report called a Notice of Infraction, or NOI, that is issued to the property owner. The NOI serves as a guide for the property owner, detailing what needs to be fixed to satisfy code requirements and to avoid paying a fine. In addition, ORI includes DOB's proactive inspection program. This team of dedicated inspectors reaches out to and inspects residential buildings with three or more units based on an algorithm that identifies the properties most likely to have violations. The proactive inspections team works with the tenants and property owners to inspect as many parts of the identified properties as possible. As with complaint-based inspections, any violations identified are memorialized in an NOI that is provided to the property owner as a roadmap to bringing the property into compliance. Complaint-based inspections tend to find more violations than proactive inspections. This is not surprising, as the entire reason a complaint-based inspection occurs is because a member of the public is reporting a condition that they believe violates the code. In fiscal year 2023, complaint-based inspections resulted in almost 7,000 NOIs, which was more than twice as many as the proactive program. In fiscal year 23, each NOI had 3.2 housing code violations on average. For cases opened in fiscal year 23, DOB has confirmed abatement of almost 8,400 violations identified by the complaint-based program. This means that for every NOI issued by the complaint-based program, 1.2 violations are confirmed abated for district residents. The remaining two violations per NOI both might be confirmed abated in coming months as the NOIs work through the resolution process and represent room for DOB's team to grow its abatement confirmation effectiveness. In short, the complaint-based housing and property maintenance inspection program is effective and makes a positive difference for district residents. The program has consistently exceeded its key performance indicators, or KPIs. In fiscal year 23, it performed 96.4% of inspections within 15 business days of the customer's complaint, as compared to the target of just 80%. On the enforcement side, the program initiated 99.6% of NOIs within two business days of conducting the inspection, exceeding the target of 90%. Both KPIs are displayed on DOB's public dashboard at dob.dc.gov, where residents can follow them live, updated daily. In addition, internal workload measures indicate DOB responds within 72 hours to complaints where the complainant indicates there is a potential life safety violation. DOB promotes cross-training opportunities across our inspector pool. And as a result, inspectors at times work in teams and have a varied workload. BBL inspections can often be done by less experienced inspectors, whereas proactive inspections are usually led by the most experienced inspectors on the team. Complaint-based inspections fall in between the other two types in terms of complexity and are performed by a variety of team members. There are four levels of housing code inspector, ranging from specialist to certified inspector with escalating requirements for training and certification at each level. Our housing code specialists are entry level and require no certification. Housing code inspector ones require international property maintenance code 
or IPMC, certification from the International Codes Council, the ICC. While our housing code inspector twos and threes require additional ICC certifications, such as commercial certification or specialized certifications such as plumbing, electrical, and mechanical. DOB provides live ICC certification training to the team throughout the year, both to increase skill sets and to maintain current certification credentials. DOB reimburses our inspectors whenever they pass a final exam. In addition, DOB provides onboarding training, including detailed explanations and overviews of every aspect of the agency and its mission. These are archived in our digital training academy platform, Trainual, that all DOB team members have access to and can review as often as needed. These trainings are also offered live and in person when needed. Each training involves interactive quizzes to gauge comprehension, and DOB's training team solicits direct feedback from the trainees to assess if training met staff needs and to capture continual improvement opportunities. With this support, members of the Office of Residential Inspections may enter as a housing code specialist and climb the ranks to housing code inspector three within three years. DOB is strengthening its training protocols in line with the committee report's recommendations and always, recommend, and always welcomes constructive feedback from our community partners. A well-trained workforce can provide better customer service and deliver better results for the district. Our training team consistently tracks best practices in the training arena, including among neighboring jurisdictions, to better help prepare our team. In addition, ORI is currently going through the DOB STAT process. Based on techniques and best practices developed in New York City, Baltimore, and the state of Maryland, the STAT is an exhaustive look at the entire program to identify gaps and craft solutions. Although the process is broader than just training, the STAT process will also serve as a comprehensive assessment of training needs for the team. Using the STAT process as a tool, Director Hanlon's vision for ORI is to emphasize quality of inspections over quantity. Inspections should be thorough, accurate, and timely. Quality inspections lead to quality customer outcomes and improved customer satisfaction and better outcomes for the district. At their core, inspections are fact-finding missions. ORI is focused on generating thoughtful and thorough documentation of the facts on the ground so that the property owner becomes aware of the violations that need to be abated. Swift abatement allows property owners to take advantage of DOB's Deferred Enforcement Program. If a property owner abates emergency violations within 24 hours and all violations within 60 days, NOIs related to those violations operate as wardings without fines. Property owners can confirm abatement using a portal located on DOB's website to upload conforming evidence. A special team of advanced housing inspectors reviews and confirms the submitted evidence. If any doubt exists to the veracity of abatement, the case is not resolved until sufficient evidence of abatement is provided. Property owners can identify each open violation on DOB's public dashboard using the landlord violations tool. There is a link to the abatement portal directly from that tool. If abatement evidence is not submitted, or if the evidence is insufficient, DOB will reinspect to confirm abatement or confirm that the case needs to be prosecuted. Communication is key to this entire process. DOB does not abate most housing code violations single-handedly. The tens of thousands of violations that ORI highlights each year are abated through cooperation with property owners, property managers, and other responsible individuals. To abate these violations, individuals need to understand what is wrong with the property. Making sure more NOIs are reliably delivered to the correct person is a key agency priority. To that end, 
DOB identified a housing complaint clearinghouse as a strategy in its fiscal year 23 to fiscal year 25 strategic enforcement plan. This plan builds on DOB's current database of contacts associated with the proactive inspection program and creates a master list for use across the entire ORI caseload. Landlords, management companies, and property owners will continue to be encouraged to update their license contact information using DOB's housing registry portal, which is included in the violations and abatement tool on our dashboard to ensure that DOB has the best possible contact information data for the clearinghouse. Making the progress that I've referenced today and elevating the quality of housing code inspections centers the need for increased resources. In addition, while higher quality inspections should eventually lead to lower complaint-based demand for DOB services, DOB will not directly control that public demand and will have to continue to respond whenever called upon. Even further, because ORI also performs numerous BBL and proactive inspections, the needs are compounded. It is important to remember that every additional inspector hired by DOB requires a corresponding investment in additional non-inspector full-time employees to support their work. Scheduling, notice of infraction generation, abatement confirmation, fine settlement, adjudication, and management of growing teams all require additional work beyond the field work done by inspectors. However, with appropriate resources, DRB looks forward to continued collaboration with the council and our other stakeholders to improve the effectiveness of our residential inspections team. Our team does valuable work and we are dedicated to continuing to elevate our service delivery to make our homes happier, our families safer and advance the district's comeback plan. Thank you again. And I look forward to answering your questions and continuing this important discussion. Thank you, Mr. Parsons. So we'll do uh, probably a couple rounds of 10 minutes with council members. So I'll go first. Um, so Mr. Parsons, first, uh, you've looked at the report that's been posted by the Committee of the Whole. Your oral statement doesn't speak to any of the recommendations. Do you want to speak to the recommendations? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I submitted a written uh, longer version yes. of the statement uh, that addresses each of the recommendations in turn. Uh, I'm happy to read that into the record if you would prefer. I, it was no, because I won't have 10 minutes left. <laughs> but uh, in a few words, probably more than a few. Um, generally, what's your re what's your response to the recommendations? With some exception, most of the recommendations we are. Uh, largely in agreement with and, and want to work to, to meet those expectations. For example, the training recommendations, uh, you know, we're always happy to make uh, our training more comprehensive, more thorough. Um, so yes, uh, the recommendations are well received. And um, I don't have the recommendations right in front of me, although I could in a second, but one that really, maybe not recommendation, but problem that really stuck out for me was that of the sample that the committee looked at, 56% of the notices went to the wrong place. What What is the department doing about that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So the primary way we are going to address that gap is with the uh, housing complaint clearinghouse, building out the internal um, the internal contact list that is going to make sure that all of the landlords receive my notices. I do want to make one important uh, sort of clarification. So when we create a notice of infraction, the civil infractions team gets legal service. And if we can't get legal service, then it doesn't move forward. So the infractions that were reviewed by your office were ones where we satisfied the requirements for legal service. 
the uh, problem is that there is a difference between legal service and actual notice. If the property owner leaves uh, legal contacts in the records trail, but then moves away from that address or updates their contact not on the official record, we can achieve legal service while they may or may not receive the actual document. But we are dedicated to improving that and the housing complaint clearing house is how we're gonna do it. Uh, it strikes me there could be maybe more done such as um, a periodic reminder to a housing provider. Um, this is the contact information we have or uh, another approach might be um, a periodic uh, email that sort of that you either design that it'll bounce back if it doesn't work or you design so that you get a response so that you know that that's a legitimate email. I'm sort of saying those off the cuff, but it seems to me a little bit more than just one approach. So we do, uh, Mr. Chairman, watch for bounce backs. If something bounce backs, bounces back on service, we do not count that as effective service. Uh, the challenge with any sort of send a reminder to providers to update their contact information is, of course, if we don't have the contact information for them, they're not going to get the reminder in the same way. But I agree, Mr. Chairman, this is a, a tough question and we're dedicated to looking at it. Um, the last couple of years, the council has tried to put more resources into Department of Buildings, more inspectors in particular. How many, do you know how many vacancies you have right now? Yes, Mr. Chairman, we have 10 inspector vacancies in the Office of Residential Inspections. And that's 10 out of how many? Just a moment. So we have 48 total inspectors, and that includes five managers and nine contractors. And so if I'm reading that correctly, 14 from 48 is 34, 10 vacancies, so you have about 24. No, no, no. Uh, apologies, Mr. Chairman. We have 48 uh, folks. We have 48 boots on the ground. In addition, there are 10 vacancies. So the total, if the team hired 10 more people, we would have 58 people and be at full strength from the inspector uh, perspective. Uh, thank you. Um, the, um, I wanna ask about reinspections because I asked that of some uh, of the tenants who testified earlier. Right now, uh, do you do reinspections in all cases? So every case, Mr. Chairman, when it is uh, resulted into a notice of infraction is scheduled for reinspection. And if it's an emergency notice of infraction, it's scheduled for reinspection within the next couple of days. If it's a routine violation, it gets scheduled out at 60 days. Yeah. Those reinspections move forward unless uh, other events happen to have us cancel them such as if abatement was confirmed and the case was closed out before the 60 days. How's the abatement confirmed? The landlord sends you a notice. It says we abated it. It would likely be through the portal if it was not confirmed by a reinspection. That is correct. Okay. Um, the report recommends that if you don't hear, don't reinspect just go proceed with the NOI. Do you agree? Uh, Mr. Chairman, that was an interesting recommendation and an interesting, it raised the interesting question, you know, is it worth doing these automatic reinspections? And so I had our data team run the data and we found that between October 1st and December 31st of this past year, so the most recent full quarter, that more than 2,000 violations were confirmed abated through our automated 
go out without anyone asking us rescheduled inspection process. If we extrapolate that over the entire year, that means about 8,000 violations are gonna be confirmed through this process. And the total violation confirmation in fiscal year 23 was around 12,000 violations. So this is actually an enormously impactful uh, program for confirming abatement. Are there possibly better ways? I'm definitely open to suggestions, but the data suggests that if we do not do this, we are going to more than have the abatement that we confirm, which is gonna magnify the problem of adjudication and uh, the OAH backlog and issues I, like that. I think I got lost. If you don't reinspect, then that would negatively affect the Office of Administrative Hearings process? Correct. So the reinspections that we do automatically without anyone calling us back and asking us to come out are confirming thousands of abatements. And the alternative resolution team and the attorneys and other members of my team, when they see a notice of infraction, has it's got abatement confirmed, it can either be pulled out of the uh, prosecution entirely if it qualifies for deferred enforcement, or it can be settled. So it, that's a good thing. If we confirm abatement, we can pull them out of the out of the OAH process. See, my reaction is a little bit different. I'm not sure what my reaction is. Um, I think I heard some testimony that when a provider says it's been abated and sends you evidence, that it's not always good evidence, and that there ought to be a reinspection to actually confirm that the grainy pictures actually reflect an abatement. Um, I'm not sure what I think, and my time's up. So let me turn to a colleague. So Council Member Robert White. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And unfortunately, I'll only be able to do one round. I have uh, community office hours in 30 minutes. Um, no, but you don't get 30 minutes on this round. <laughs> 20. Um, uh, I appreciate you uh, being with us, uh, uh, Mr. Parsons. And um, some of some of my questions will be a bit redundant, but it's just because I'm I'm trying to make sure I'm I'm following and understanding as well. Um, first, um, do do we have a database of violations that are sortable by building owner, management company, um, and uh, property address so that we can see? Um, sort of um, common issues to the extent they exist? Yes. So first, that's a great question because it lets me give the gospel of my dashboards. The violations and abatement tool or the landlord abatement tool on the public dashboard allows anyone who wants to, to go online, look at open violations. They can search by address. They can search by landlord name. Um, they can search by fiscal year. There's all sorts of ways to sort it. That is pulling from DOB's actual database, which has even more options. So we actually have very uh, rigorous and, and good violations data. It does start around 2018, was around when we really started uh, collecting this data. So it's not going to give you a uh, look back if you're looking yeah. back 20 years. But the answer is yes. Okay. Um, who has access to, to that database? So the parts of it that display on the public dashboard, everyone. Anyone can see it. Um, what doesn't come through the public dashboard, uh, you would have to ask DOB. Okay. So if I if I live at Marbury Plaza, could I go and see how many violations exist for that property? Yes. And in fact, I looked up Marbury Plaza during the testimony earlier. And when I pulled it up, and, and the way to do it would be to look under the owner, MPPPH LLC, uh, there were 570 violations unabated on that property okay. as of right now. And... Um, <laughs> How how many 
proactive um, repairs has DOB made? I don't know if you track that by fiscal year, calendar year. If you are referring to um, times where the Department of Buildings itself or a contractor paid by the Department of Buildings actually repairs something, then moment here, it's trying to give you the right number. I want to say it's 670 in the prior fiscal year. I can get back to you with the exact number. It would not include those unless we cited a corresponding housing code violation that, for example, we could cite a leak or water damage uh, under the housing code. We would not cite mold just as, a, as itself. But to the extent that we do, then yes, those would display on the dashboard. Um. <clears throat> Now, what about a uh, broader inspection? So Marbury Plaza has well over 500 uh, unabated violations. If in, we included mold, uh, probably would be a lot more clearly systemic issue in their property. Um, one of the recommendations from tenants was to do um, um, a full uh, inspection of, of every unit. Is, is that something DOB has considered? It's, uh, it's not just something, well, when I give this answer, I'm including the former DCRA in it. We have done a full inspection of it. It has not been for a number of years. Um, it, is, it is something I'm happy to consider again. And, <clears throat> When, uh, when a violation is reported, does DOB go look at the violation before the abatement? So if I if I'm a resident and I say I have a a, a broken window, how do you confirm that the issue the the issue to begin with? Uh, DOB would confirm with an inspection. If if you go in and you say, you know, you fill out a form, you say, I have a broken window, we would conduct either a uh, in-person or um, virtual inspection. And if the inspector agreed that the window was broken and that it was a violation, it would be cited. Okay. And I know the chairman asked about this. Um, after abatement, um, who does the, is there, is there a reinspection? Well, it depends. So as I was saying, we schedule automatic reinspections. Um, and so if that's what's happening, then that inspection may be what confirms a date. We would not we wouldn't come out again unless the tenant called us out again and said there was a new problem. Okay. Now, but how do you confirm that the the original issue that the tenant complained about was fixed? It is either confirmed through a reinspection or through the portal, uh, landlord abatement portal, and the landlord would submit uh, basically evidence that has to convince our inspectors uh, that it's actually fixed. 
and they're instructed, you know, to be rigorous about it. You got to make sure there's a photo of, uh, you know, each violation being fixed. Um, if it's something where you're providing some sort of uh, work document, we definitely look at those, scrutinize those, make sure they uh, appear to be genuine. We have sometimes called up the uh, contractor to make sure that they actually did the work. So it is not a rubber stamp process. It's a rigorous process. And if there's any doubt from the team, they kick it back to an actual uh, reinspection where someone goes out and looks. Okay. Um, some of the testimony we heard today from, from residents was that there's there's no follow up to make sure the repairs were done uh, from their perspective. Um, how do we? How do you? How does DOB engage with residents, uh, or does DOB engage with residents to say, hey? We heard from the landlord or property management company that the repair was made. Do you confirm that with the resident? So DOB in this circumstance with residential inspections interacts with residents primarily on scheduling the access for the unit. After the inspection is conducted, the resident can request a copy of the notice of infraction. At this time, we don't um, reach out after abatement is confirmed in the portal. I know that's a suggestion from the testimony, and that's something that I'm happy to look at uh, and talk about with the team. Sure. Oh, because what I'm wondering is if I'm a resident, I complain about an issue, and you confirm with the building owner or the management company that the issue was fixed, I probably feel out of the loop and I may be the best position to say, no, they didn't really fix this. Um, and that seems to be uh, what residents are, are suggesting happens uh, from their view. Um, is, there a, is there a way to keep residents and particularly those who make the complaints looped into uh, the abatement process and, and outcomes? So the long-term plan is for that to be part of the housing complaint clearinghouse process, but I'm happy to look at short-term possibilities as well. Sure. Uh, I am over. I, are you, is this your only round? It is. Do you want to go a couple more minutes? I appreciate it. I won't, I won't go uh, more than that. Um, the, the, one of the recommendations from from a resident was to to have a, a tenant as part of sort of um, the uh, repair and abatement process. Uh, I don't immediately know what that would look like, um, but I think there is not faith in you know government that this is happening well. And the reason is because people are living in these bad conditions and they don't see how you know a working system they end up living in conditions like this. So to, to add an element, I think, of, of confidence, one of the suggestions was to put a resident uh, in, in somewhere in the um, investigation and repair process. Do you see a place uh, where, where that could happen? Short answer, yes. Uh, when we have the housing complaint clearinghouse and have reliable uh, landlord and tenant contact information, it is going to be much easier to uh, keep the tenants in that communication. All right. uh, I think only two more questions. If, I, if I'm a resident and I call you about pervasive mold, what happens? So the Department of Buildings would go out and inspect. We would cite any of the building code violations as normal, would issue an NOI as normal. If the inspector sees evidence of mold, they will put a notation in the file that has an automatic referral system that goes to the Department of Energy and Environment so that they know to engage their process and reach out to the tenant and start uh, that process. 
uh, with using Mulberry Plaza as an example, I think it's clear at this point that um, the issues are not going to be repaired without the government stepping in or some significant intervening uh, act. Does DOB have authority today to go in and address the 500 plus unabated issues? Well, council member, the legal, on the legal side, the Department of Buildings has the authority to, uh, and this is through a statute I don't have in front of me, but the mayor has the authority to make basically anything that's a violation. Um, as I indicated, our, uh, our fiscal ability to do those kinds of abatements in this context in a whole year last year was 500 some and Marbury Plaza alone has over 500 violations. So the, the problem is uh, fiscal. What would it uh, take for DOB to assess roughly what, how much you would need to make those repairs? Um, I, I, I couldn't answer that here today, Council Member, but I'm happy to uh, brief your office on, on those issues if you'd like to go into depth. Uh, I appreciate it. I, I would uh, appreciate being briefed on that. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, and uh, thank you to uh, DOB and Mr. Parsons. Uh, thank you, Council Member White. Council Member Lewis George. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, and I too will only have uh, one round as I have a public safety meeting in Ward 4, um, but want to thank uh, DOB uh, for, for being here um, and attentive to these questions and for your thorough um, opening statement, but also the elongated statement that you provided. Um, I want to uh, start with some questions about um, sort of the complaint process um, and some of the information we've heard, but uh, what we what we know uh, from some of the witnesses um, and from experiences in the ward. Uh, we heard earlier testimony about the complaint process, the forms um, being difficult, and we've also heard about language access issues. Uh, what uh, mitigating steps are you willing to take based on the recommendations um, and the testimony today to uh, rather swiftly get us a better a, a better application process and, and to close the language barrier gaps? Thank you for the question, uh, Council Member, because it gives me the opportunity to give great news on the record that we are updating our form right now. Uh, I had hoped it would go live beforehand so I could say it was done, but it's uh, going to go live very, very soon. Okay. It, includes, uh, it includes language access elements so that uh, someone who's presented with the form uh, has uh, banners where they can, if they speak that language, go to a page that will get them help yes. using the forms. Um, we are uh, basically the last step before we're going to go live with it is to workshop the draft we've come up with with tenants. And uh, that's uh, Children's right. Law Center mentioned we'd reached out to them and uh, let them know about that opportunity. So, um, so yes, we, we're about to make the new form and it will have language access elements. Great. And there have been conversations and uh, we have a number of senior buildings, which I'll talk about a little bit uh, in a second. Um, how will you address the tech issues for seniors, for example, who don't have the ability, maybe not have access to computer, may just not want to use a computer? Um, what are What steps are we taking to address seniors in that application process? Well, there's no plan to um, to end phone calls. Um, right. and we're also looking at, uh, in that same conversation with uh, Children's Law Center, they expressed that uh, some folks have trouble with our phone tree. We're in the middle of revamping our phone tree as well. So that is always going to be an option. Um, 311 also feeds into uh, the Department of Buildings. So. The reason we like the form is because it uh, it feeds right into a system that gives our managers and the rest of our staff a lot of visibility. But there will always be options for those that 
I don't want work okay. to use that. And when they call, my hope is that when they call, they're not told, oh, go online and do this form. I think a number of times when seniors call, there are people who will say, oh, you can go online and do this. Um, my hope is that when seniors call, if they're unable to use tech, that whoever is on the other line of the phone is able to enter the information and submit it for them via uh, the online form. Is that your understanding of how it will how it will be, uh, how the phone line will work and move forward? Uh, yes, Chair Lewis George, that is not only how it will work moving forward, that's the current instructions to our to our team. So if folks right. aren't doing that, let us know and we're happy to train them up in the correct way. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I uh, I do want to thank DOB for working with my office uh, and me to address uh, some concerns. We've two properties, I think, are a good example of uh, how we can improve communications and issues and, and ways we can work together. Uh, the Madison Apartments at 56, 16, 13 Street Northwest um, and the Todd e., uh, A. Lee Senior Building at 809 Kennedy Street Northwest Residence. Um, with these properties, you know, I've written multiple letters to OEG, your office, D.C., uh, um, HA and MPD. Um, and uh, it took, it, it seemed like it took a while, not on your end, but coordinating with the other agencies for relief or answers for residents at the community, sort of from rodents to broken doors, trash not being collected and security issues. Um, and the conditions were deplorable. Um, describe to me sort of what the process looks like with coordination between DOB, Department of Health and other agencies that may need to get involved with inspections. Thank you, uh, Chair Lewis George. So first there is the process that I described earlier with the example of DOEE, where a residential inspector makes a notation on the file and it sends an email. We have that process in place for many other agencies. So if we see someone that needs, uh, you know, perhaps Department of Behavioral Health or uh, OTA, Office of the Tenant Advocate, um, we can refer out to those agencies so that they can also help. Um, in the specific examples of sort of escalated enforcement with the Office of the Attorney General, I have a standing meeting with the Office of the Attorney General on escalated enforcement. In fact, it is today, I had uh, someone on my team cover it for me to, to be here today, where we share prospective cases that we are looking at. We ask for updates on things that are currently shared interest between the agencies and, uh, you know, talk strategy. Um, so we do engage in cross-agency collaboration on a number of levels. Got it. Um, want to talk about turnaround time per the dashboard there are about 91 outstanding violations across sort of both addresses that I mentioned um, as of of yesterday January 17th how long is the process from the time someone files a complaint until it is resolved that will depend on a whole lot of circumstances so it could be as soon as uh, the day after the inspection. And it could, be, it could be sooner. It could be that if the landlord just doesn't know and the mm -hmm. tenant tells the landlord, instead of filing the complaint, the landlord will say, oh, well, I need to fix this and they will just fix it. Um, it could be that the landlord receives the NOI and says, I want deferred enforcement. Um, you know, I, I want to get out from under this and immediately fixes it. Or it could be that it goes through the process, the landlord doesn't fix it and uh, waits for the adjudication process to play out. Technically, at the end of the adjudication process, all that happens at OEH is fines are issued. The landlord never has to abate, they can, let a judgment be issued against them for fines or they can pay the fines. So this is going to depend on the circumstances of the case and the actions of the landlord. Got it. So uh, that lines up. So on like on the Cal uh, Cal's report, it states on average over seven months passed from the date on which an NOI was filed with OAH, the date on which a final order was issued. 
Um, over half, 53% of the final rulings on NOIs found the respondent in default and liable for, for, for violations. I want to ask you, can a housing provider fix an issue past the time allotted but still not pay a fine? And if so, what is the follow-up to collect the fine? Uh, and then the second question to that, is there anything preventing someone from buying multiple buildings but still having thousands of dollars of fines or unresolved notices of infractions? If a housing provider uh, goes beyond the deferred enforcement timeframes, then the team is generally instructed to not accept a uh, dismissal and to settle for some amount of the fine at best. And that's if someone is very uh, compliant, did abate, just missed the timeframes, then they can make you know, a settlement that'll be um, beneficial. Um, if, if they go beyond it, then um, no. I guess the answer is no. Apologies, Council no. Member. Could you repeat the end of your question? Is there anything preventing someone from buying multiple buildings but still having $1,000 of fines or unresolved notices of infractions? Not to my knowledge, Council Member. Got it. Um, on page 19 of the report, it states that up to 48 hours before a scheduled in-person inspection, DOB must contact the tenant to determine if the violations are still pending. Um, and if the problems have not been abated, DOB gives a person a two hour window to arrive on the inspection date. Um, um, I I've had a call about someone that took off of work and the inspector never showed, what is your process to ensure inspectors are communicating to tenants and doing timely inspections? Because one email told the resident uh, that took off work to disregard the business hours because inspectors set their own schedules. And then the second email scheduled the inspection for midnight. Council member, if uh, you send me the exact case, I'd okay. be happy to look into to those observed issues. In general, if we find out that our inspectors are not uh, inspecting when they should, um, we look into it and we uh, take disciplinary action as, as necessary. Okay. Um, let me ask you, do you know how many property owners were eligible, eligible for deferred enforcement program in fiscal year 23? I do not have that information, but I can get back to you with that if you would like. Got it. Um, I want to go back to the Toddy Lee building. Um, as you know, we've been working with Department of Health and DOB and trying to get uh, air quality issues addressed. Um, and I want to just understand the limitations DOB has on um, and, and limitations DOE he has in, these, in that particular circumstance um, on uh, doing air quality inspections um, and ensuring that the owners of the property owners are doing air quality um, in uh, meeting the air quality issues, especially in that issue where we had, uh, I think, rodents and a number of abatements for the rodents, and then it caused uh, not only an odor but but some issues for um, tenants in that building. Um, if I understand the question correctly, uh, Chair Lewis George, a odor itself. Is, is likely not to be a housing code violation. We would go into that situation. We would cite any housing code violations that existed under our processes. <laughs> and then we would refer to our sister agency, uh, DOEE, for further, for further work. Got it. Um, in this situation, I think there's just a, I think there's a legislative or a legal gap here. It's DOEE, and I think both DOB are saying that they um, cannot or don't have the authority to do a air quality a air quality check for the the seniors in that residence. Well, I I can't speak for uh, DOEE Chair Lewis George, but um, as, as I said, a odor is not going to be a housing code violation by itself. If we find a citable source, that would be where we would engage in our enforcement. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'm over my time. Um, thank you, uh, 
for uh for your uh questions uh, your answers to the questions and then I will have some follow up on the specific instances that we've we've seen in our office. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lewis George. Councilmember Fruman. Thank you very much, Chairman Mendelson. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm going to go back to some of the building-wide kinds of issues that came up and just uh, consider a scenario where somebody makes a complaint, a tenant makes a complaint, they're in apartment 224. And so your inspector would go to apartment 224 and inspect there to look to see what things, whether or not there's a real violation there. In the process, they would have passed through a lot of common areas. and. Do your inspectors look for things in the common areas that might go to the initial authorization to be a landlord? Locks that are working, security things that might be done. Is there any element of that of looking not just at the one apartment, not knocking on every door in the building, but looking at the common areas? Thank you, council members. So Primarily, the inspections are either targeted at a specific unit or uh, if it's a proactive inspection, we are doing a building-wide inspection that's going to necessarily uh, include common areas. If we get complaints about common areas, a complaint-based inspection can review and cite for common areas. So uh, I guess the answer is yes. If the tenant says, common areas are bad and my unit is bad, come out and look at this. Uh, we have the capability to look at both of those. Okay, and then, and you said proactive inspection might be building wide. What, what kind of criteria do you use to decide whether or not to do a proactive building wide inspection? You talked about, yes, you'd done it at Marbury Plaza some time ago. What feeds into that decision to do that? The tool that we use for proactive inspections is an algorithm that maps certain attributes of the property. Uh, it uses an attribute called the functional age of the property, which is either its actual age or when it was last uh, fully renovated to the point where it should have been at new quality. It uses whether uh, there is an active license or an inactive license. It looks at the last time DOB has been out there at all for any type of inspection. And it takes these attributes, it maps them onto the housing stock, and then we train it against our violation data and say, you know, here's the attributes of these properties, here's the violations we found which ones are most likely to have more violations. And so that creates a list, which we then, uh, the program basically receives it as a list from the, the tech guys that do the, the, you know, the hard part. And then we go down the list, uh, we give notice about two months out to the property owner, we give notice to the building, we go out and post the building, um, but that's that's how we how we target it. All right, that's that's good. That's helpful. And the number of violations is one of the factors that's taken into account. So if you had a building with a very high number of violations, you might, and it was an old building, you might then say, okay, we're going to proactively pursue a building wide inspection here. Um, one of the things that got raised is contacting the landlords, and it made me think. There's a bunch of different databases out there. So you you have a database that I suppose is their business license that might have been you know could could have been a long time ago. Um, there are other databases that are out there now. I think the rent administrator is supposed to come up with uh, reports on rent. We've all been sitting on the edge of our chair for a year to see those, um, but that that will have information. There's also the income and expense reports that are done that are required by uh, the Office of Tax and Revenue. Do you have access to those kinds of other reports that would be a, a source of information about uh, to identify and contact landlords? Thank you for the, the question. 
uh, Council Member Fruman, because this is exactly what we want to do when we're building out the housing complaint clearinghouse. I don't know if we have access to those specific reports. What we use right now when we are trying to find and serve the landlord is one, the proactive housing registry, which is where when they renew their proactive registration for all buildings with three or more units, they have to provide an email for us to use to bill them and we use that for service as well. So that's pretty good for those big uh, buildings that qualify. Then we also look at the Office of Tax and Revenues property detail, which is a version of, uh, of what's in OTR's database. We also look at the Department of Licensing and Consumer Protection's corporate uh, business records, if it's owned by an LLC, for example. And if we don't find anything uh, in those, we also look to our other internal sources uh, in our customer communications uh, system. We might have other emails. Um, if we're still finding nothing, we also look in the recorder of deeds and LexisNexis. So that's what we currently consult as we build out uh, a more authoritative list designed to achieve actual notice more reliably. We'd love to look at other sources and we will. One of the things that intrigues me, I haven't, I haven't had an opportunity to look at the income and expense reports. Uh, I think that you know, they're, they're close held, they're confidential, but I wonder in a setting in which you have lots of violations, whether you might get access to the income and expense reports for a landlord to see what sort of investment they've been making in maintenance and repair, because I think, you know, one of the things that came up was landlords who were talking about uh, good faith and and the there could be evidence of investment that suggested that, or there could be evidence that these are properties that are being left to decay. To what extent do you have access to information around, about the financials of the landlords, and to what extent do you use that information? I'm not sure what you're referring to, but I'd like to figure out if I've answered or if I've access to it. It does sound intriguing. Who, where are these filed? It's with OTR. It's an income and expense report that landlords are supposed to file every year that summarizes what, you know, what their income has been and what their expenses have been. I have not reviewed them. I asked to, you know, to what extent could I get access to it? But in a setting where you have a landlord who's in front of you, who you're trying to deal with, I would think inside of the government, maybe you, you would, I think it's a thing that's worth your exploring with OTR. I'm happy to explore that, Council Member. Um, you know, there was a lot of talk about the reinspection process, and I just want to make sure if I can understand the, the numbers. So using to, uh, fiscal year 23, I think you said you applied 12,000 um, abatements, 8,000 of them that came from reinspection, 4,000 of them that came from landlord certification. And then how many would have gone to OAH so they weren't abated up front? How, how many then go on to OAH? So everything that isn't abated and resolved goes to OAH. And if how you're many... looking at the, for the scale in fiscal year 23, uh, we identified about 30,000 uh, housing code violations. So if 12,000 of those, or excuse me, um, well, 800 of those in the, in the uh, complaint-based process are being resolved and 2,200 or 22,000 are moving forward to OAH. Well, I thought that you said, I thought you came up with an estimate that it was 8,000 that might have been done through reinspection and 4,000 that would have been done by landlord certification. So that would suggest 18,000 that went on to OAH. And so it's interesting because, as you were saying, the two thirds of the, of the violations that were found to have been abated were found to have been abated through reinspection, not through landlord certification, which 
does create an interesting issue in terms of whether or not you want to keep doing that. If you didn't do that, you'd have 26,000 cases go to OAH instead of 18. And if you, on the other hand, should you reinspect the ones where the landlords have certified, you would then end up increasing the numbers that you would be reinspecting by around 4,000. So it's an interesting conundrum, but, uh, and I don't want to offer an answer to that question right now. Um, Is this your only round? I, you know what, I'll do another round. Okay. Uh, so I will stop. You might get more time that way. Um, hmm. But just to follow up on that, I thought I heard differently that the um, number of Landlord attestation, I don't know if they formally at, attest, but that the violation was abated is higher than the number that you don't get a response. And accepting the landlord saying it's abated significantly reduces the number of cases you send to OAH. Have I confused this? I hope I haven't confused you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me let me see if I can clear up the confusion, and, uh, and I'll talk in, in in pretty broad numbers here. So we have thirty thousand total violations identified in fiscal year twenty three across both complaint based and the proactive program. We have twelve thousand abatements confirmed by the landlord. Well, total, 12,000 abatements from total. Out of those 12,000 abatements, approximately 8,000 are confirmed by reinspection. And that's the number that I had my guys pull. I believe that others are gonna be abatement portal cases. If I looked into them, there's probably some diversity there, but I'm happy to, Dive deeper with your office if you want to think about so this more. So 12,000 out of 30,000, these numbers are approximate. 12,000 out of 30,000 are baited. Of the ones that are baited, 8,000 were, the landlord was probably the one who said we abated them. Uh -huh. I got it wrong, reinspection. The reinspection said they were. So the reinspection is really important. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. And then for the other, so if it's 30 and 12, then for the other 18,000 that are all going to go off to OAH, maybe not all of them, but most of them, OAH process is such that a reinspection is helpful to the case. A reinspection would be, would most likely end up with the case settling out or being dismissed if it determines abatement. If it doesn't determine abatement, then yes, it would be part of the chain of evidence that could be presented. We found the violations in the first inspection. Here they are in the NOI. We re-inspected on such and such a date. They were not abated. That is correct. OK. Um, The committee found that there were over 9,000 NOIs currently pending with the Office of Administrative Hearings, a number even higher than what was reported by the Office of Administrative Hearings in February of last year. What steps, if any, can or will the department take to work with OAH on the backlog? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So first off, we have a monthly meeting with OAH to work on that issue. The primary way that the Department of Buildings moves notices of, inf of infraction away from OAH is through things like deferred enforcement, through the alternative resolution team, proactively reaching out to customers whose cases we know are abated to try to settle them and move them out of the OAH flow. And are proactively this is a relatively new initiative, reaching out to uh, customers who haven't abated and trying to get them to settle. And this dovetails with the committee's recommendation on, on sending nudges. This is something that we are interested in as well. 
obviously the more we can push people into abating, that is going to give us the power to remove these from the chain of OEH um, to, you know, decrease this backlog. And we've also done some trainings uh, most recently on the 11th. I did the first round of a training to make sure that the inspectors are focusing on the most important violations on the most uh, uh, well documented and able to be prosecuted if necessary violations and not uh, trying to stretch or cite anything that would end up uh, not moving forward at OAH. So that is how we are looking to um, reduce that flow to the extent it's possible. Many of those NOIs, however, are actual cases where we went out. In fact, most or all of them are cases where we went out. We found actual violations. There are tenants who say, why hasn't this been fixed? Why hasn't the landlord paid a fine if it hasn't been fixed? And so ultimately, in those cases where we can't verify abatement, they have to, they have to move forward. They have to be prosecuted. Uh, the department has created mechanisms such as deferred enforcement and the alternative response team. They're meant to incentivize abatement of violations prior to filing with the Office of Administrative Hearings. What steps is the department taking? What steps are, is, are the department taking to ensure that property owners are aware of these options. So do you think all property owners are aware of the options? And if not, what steps are you taking? We are working as hard as we can to make sure that they are. And I wanna thank uh, you, uh, Chairman Mendelson and uh, Chair Lewis George and the rest of the council for having this hearing in part to sort of raise the profile of these issues. What uh, we have done is every NOI now generates with an explanation of both deferred enforcement and the alternative resolution program that started uh, sometime in the fall. So I don't know for sure whether the NOIs that your office reviewed had those yet. It's a relatively recent development. Um, as the committee report did note, there is mention of it on the face of the actual violations page of the NOI. It's not very long, which is why we did the full one page uh, explanation. And there's also the uh, built environment enforcement working group, which is uh, a working group run by my office created under the strategic enforcement plan that handles issues of enforcement um, related to my office. We've done uh, two different segments focused on deferred enforcement with uh, with landlords through that process. So we are trying to get the word out. And uh, we're also in the middle of revising all of our web pages, uh, both the ones that are directly under my, uh, my programs and eventually the rest of the website. To get so, the word out. Let me move to another question. What role, if any, does the department play once a final order has been issued by OAH? After the final order issues first, we have to receive it and record it in our records. Uh, that's where we get the amount to be invoiced. If it isn't paid, uh, then we record a lien against the property. And if it isn't paid after 180 days, we send it to the central collection. Unit. So you could tell me how many in dollars and cases um, went over to central collections? We have on the public dashboard, a tab that can tell you everything that has gone over to central collections. It's on the enforcement dashboard. And it's on the far and you right. Can tell me how much you have collected. So since you said you would, you enter the information when you get it from OAH, and then you send out an invoice, I think is what you phrased. We are very close to getting that information to the point where we can put it out in the public as well. It's not 
ready today. I couldn't tell you today, but we can get back to you. What does very close mean? Like uh, this year or the next couple of months or? Definitely this year. Um, we'll see how the next couple months go. Okay. And then you said um, if it's not paid, you can place a lien. How often do you place a lien? In fiscal year 23, we placed about 1,000 liens. Let me see if I can find the right number. And that's on the properties. So in between for fiscal year 23 and fiscal year 24 to date, so I guess a year and a quarter, we placed 1,138 liens on 921 distinct properties, since sometimes a property gets multiple liens. So if I'm a bad actor and I have not abated and I lost before OAH, you can place a lien. I may end up with a lien on my property. That is correct. And I'm over my time. Councilman Buffoon. All right, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'm trying to understand workload and I'm going to stick with the 30,000 violations and then so there's 30,000 inspections if there's a violation there's an inspection and then 4,000 of those go away in the because the landlord certifies it but 26,000 of them don't go away because the landlord certifies it so I'm assuming 26,000 reinspections, so 56,000 inspections plus reinspections. It is going to be more. Um, so every the way the process works is there is an initial inspection which looks at everything. And if it finds emergency violations, those get split off for a separate reinspection. And if it finds routine violations, those get split off for another reinspection. So in general, there are going to be three inspections for one complaint. Not always, because sometimes there's only one, there's only emergency or only. Regular. So okay, so that's super helpful. So that so not fifty six thousand. Let's call it, you know, seventy thousand. And and there's, as I understand it, um, thirty four inspectors and nine contractors who I guess operate as inspectors. So forty three. So each of them would be doing fifteen hundred to two thousand inspections a year. Is that? I, I'm not looking for down to the decimal point, but ballpark, is that is that the workload that, that an inspector is facing? An individual inspector in this program inspects no more than eight times a day. So the way the scheduling works is each inspector has a sort of set number of slots for inspections. And it might be less than eight if they have other things going on, other things scheduled over it. But most at most eight slots and inspections get scheduled in as needed. If we uh, schedule all the inspections for our full-time employees, then we can deal with some of that overage with resident inspectors, with your contractors. So that, I think gives you a good idea of the inspection workload. It's going to be no more than eight a day. And in, in fact, it is less than 40 a week because there are big chunks of time that are non-inspection time. Eight is the max. I, I hear you. Very helpful. But if I think 45 weeks and if I use 40, it's not going to be 40. It's going to be lower. That would be 1,800. So, you know, 1,500 or in that ballpark seems like you know, a lot. Um, but the reason that I'm asking about it is uh, because of the 10 vacancies. So I'm curious if that 10 vacancies, 
feels like something that's stable or that's a high no higher number of vacancies than you're used to having in this in this space? This is less vacancies because we have had uh, over the past couple of years, we have had a lot of uh, slots dedicated to our inspectors in the council's budget. And we have had challenges hiring them. We are working through those, um, mostly through modifying our PDs and doing more uh, outreach and, and other things. So it is, it is less than we had, say, a year ago. But you're working to f fill those things because I mean, one of the things, you, you're always going to have consumer complaints, but you need to have enough people to be able to efficiently do things. One of the things in the testimony, maybe it's in the report, is there's a checklist, but the checklist isn't always used. You got a guy or a woman who's trying to run around the city and do, and it, this isn't every day, but eight inspections in different places, they're going to do them. They're going to do them quick, and so you, uh, the, use relying on the checklist becomes a more difficult thing to do. I hope we can help you to try to fill those vacancies. One one of the one reason for it is a different thing that we've heard, in, and you gave data on this, but I wonder if you can speak to it again. The emergency cases and getting to those cases very quickly. Uh, you, we need you to have the horses so that you can do that. But you heard testimony about circumstances in which there were, was an emergency case and it took longer than it should have. What's your response to that testimony today? As I mentioned in my uh, direct testimony, our Internal workload measure indicates that we generally respond within 72 hours to emergency uh, violation requests. If there are situations where we did not, I'm happy to look into that case. Uh, there are always outliers, but generally our data shows that we are getting out there when we need to get out there quickly. Yeah, I mean, if it's if it's an emergency, it's an emergency. So you would want to get there even more quickly than that, I would think. But in but in any case, in the outlier situations, you'll take a look at it. Um, I I'm going to go to where the chairman left off, and and he may pick it up again. Um, the nine hundred liens on nine hundred and twenty one properties. Um, so these are folks who have accumulated violations to which they haven't responded and there's fines that they have not paid. And so what describe the lien process, how large the lien is and what kinds of actions get taken um, once you have a lien in place. Thank you, council member. The size of the lien depends entirely on the size of the judgment. So for cases where they have defaulted and it may have been a large NOI to begin with, the defaults of triple damages, there may be quite large liens. I've seen liens in the multiple tens of thousands of dollars. The process with liens is that they are simply filed and sit on the title of the property. And when the property is sold, the liens are either paid off entirely, or if there's some extenuated cir ex circumstance, then uh, you know we negotiate against the lien or some part of the lien. But generally speaking, it sits on the property until the property is sold, and then it's paid. Is there any authority for seizure or forfeiture of the property if the liens get too high? The Department of Buildings does work with the Office of Tax and Revenue in the tax sale process. We refer properties to OTR every year. We just finished it yesterday. It's been a it's been a busy week, um, and so, so the short answer is 
yes, through the tax sale process, properties can ultimately be uh, sold. So, so an unpaid lien can be treated in the same way as unpaid taxes and so that it could be listed as a tax sale property? That is correct. It, is, it can be incorporated into the total amount of outstanding uh, money on the property. Um, and have you seen that happen? You, you said, you did you just refer these 921 properties that have liens or some subset of those properties that have liens have been reported over to OTR? Only a subset are referred. Uh, primarily vacant properties are what gets referred over to tax sale. We're all groping for how do you make it actually happen so that the repairs get done and so and and um, so any tool that's out there becomes an important tool. Flipping it, and this will be my last question, I promise you, Chairman Mendelson, um, but it's sort of maybe a little bit big one. You heard the testimony from the various landlords about situations in which um, maybe there's recurring damage because of the actions of the tenant or another tenant and the landlords claim to be acting in good faith and yet they're in front of you repeatedly and your people would be hearing those stories. So what is your reaction to that testimony? How frequently do you see it? How frequently do you validate it? And what kinds of things can you do or would you suggest to us should be done to address those kinds of issues? Thank you for the question, Councilmember Fruman. Those situations do happen. And what I would say to the landlords who find themselves in that situation is that they need to work with us and with the tenant, actually abate the violations. And after that, the alternative resolution team can consider the entire facts and circumstances in reaching a settlement of the fines. So if it is a situation where the landlord could have abated day one uh, and he didn't until day 20 because the tenant wanted to reschedule, we can consider that. But also importantly, it is the landlord's duty to maintain a sufficient relationship with the tenant that they can perform the basic functions of being a landlord and gain access and abate. Again, I know these are often easier said than done. We do encounter those situations, but we do expect the landlord to uh, achieve that as part of their duties as a landlord, and we are here to help them and to help bring the property back into compliance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. Um, I should have asked this earlier. So the um, the decisions by OAH that the fine is upheld in, in uh, total or in part uh, comes back to you. You enter it in the system, you issue an invoice. Um, the invoice is not paid after 180 days, you send it to central collections. For the, all the ones you send to central collections, do you also file a lien? Generally, yes. So the central collection unit uses the lien as leverage in the same way that the, you know, that we would use it as leverage. So it is generally both of those options are, are done. And I meant to ask this earlier in response to a question, I think from Councilmember Robert White. You said that if one wants to see with regard to Marbury Plaza, the online data, inspection data, well, the best way would be to look up, I think you said MPPH LLC. How would anybody know to look up MPPH LLC? My recommendation and the tool that I normally use is called Property Quest which is a map of the district and you can click on anything and it'll show you a bunch of information about the property, but it includes who owns it. So the way you know, the way any tenant could figure out the who owns their property, who's the official record owner 
and who to look for in our dashboard would be to go to property quest find their property on the map find their house on the map click on it there's a line right there um that would be my recommendation and who maintains that database is that I, private sector i don't know the answer oh, office of planning office of planning but they have up-to-date ownership information they pull from the Office of Tax and Revenue, as I understand it. So it is as up to date as the Office of Tax and Revenue information. But if I went to the DOB website, because I want to see how many housing violations there are, there would be nothing there that would tell me to go to Property Quest to look for the ownership. That's correct. That's That's one option. It's not a definitive option but i'll uh, that's an interesting suggestion and i'm happy to look at that especially as we revise our web pages and perhaps give some detailed guidance to folks on how to use the dashboard yeah great um the department currently issues two types of nois an noi emergency and an noi routine the emergency gives property owners 24 hours to abate the violation if the NOI is sent via first class, e uh, first class mail and no other means of communication with the property owner is available, how can the owner possibly address the violation in 24 hours? The deadline is 24 hours from receipt. And so the property owner should be prepared when they come to us and want to qualify for deferred enforcement to show us proof of time of receipt and time of abatement so if it's within 24 hours then they are good if there is undue delay and they can show that then they should still qualify what are the chances the property owner knows what the violation is while your inspector is there the inspector and the scheduler attempt to reach out to the property owner or property manager before the inspection is conducted so if those were successful, because they are not always, you know, people don't necessarily pick up the phone or, or look at the email, then the property owner may know. Sometimes property owners uh, come along and participate in the inspection. So sometimes they know contemporaneously, but it would depend. But it would? It would depend. On well, the case. it's a complaint about heat. Heat is a, a what is it called? It's a level one violation in the winter um and uh, so your inspector would have to go find the boiler right and is your inspector isn't your inspector first going to go knock on the uh, rental office door if i understand the hypothetical correctly the the heat violation is gonna be for within the individual unit. So they don't necessarily have to go to the boiler. If they know that if they're in the unit and they have the temperature gauge and it's below what's necessary, then they know that uh, you know the heat should be working, then that can be enough. Uh, there are certainly situations where they might need to to go try to find the boiler, but the violation is gonna depend on the conditions in the unit. Interesting, because I'm thinking of like a couple of years ago, Woodbury Village, where I got uh, complaints. I think uh, half the council did that there was no heat at the complex. It's multiple buildings. So clearly that was not a unit issue. Um, wouldn't your inspector have gone out? I mean, you can't speak to what actually happened several years ago, but using that as a hypothetical, wouldn't your inspector in that case go look for the boiler rather than go to individual units or maybe do both? Yes, it depends on how the complaint comes to us. If we get a complaint about a whole building's heat being out, we will investigate on the sort of whole building basis. If we get a complaint from an individual about their unit, we're going to generally go to the unit first. And how reliable is it? I'm guessing you'd get multiple complaints, but is that really correct? Uh, so it's what, below 32 degrees this week here in DC? So it's pretty cold. And uh, if the heat's not working, 
How reliable is it that you're going to get complaints from multiple units in the same building? Uh, How suspicious should I be that just relying on complaints doesn't work? I'm not sure how to answer the question because there's a lot of variety in complaints that we receive, right? Like the complaint could have any amount of information and we could receive a variety of numbers of them. So I'm not sure how to answer your question. Maybe I'll move on. Um, I'd asked this earlier, but I'm not sure I was completely comfortable with the answer. The department currently sends some NOIs via email. How does the department collect and verify these email addresses? The primary way is through the proactive registration portal. So these are buildings with three or more units. They have to register for the proactive program. That's how they get billed their proactive fees. It's required as part of renewing their license. They give us an email for the purpose of that billing and the uh, NOI process. For other emails, they can come to us a variety of ways, primarily through people reaching out to us. So we're not uh, we're not normally scouring the web for emails. Normally, it's someone who's emailed us and they're in our system. If that's the case, then you know we know that it worked at least once when they reached out to us. The least reliable emails we would get would be when the tenant types in the email for their landlord in the complaint form. Obviously, that's as you know as reliable or unreliable as whoever typed it typos happen. For any of those, the team that is serving will send the email and they will see if it bounces back. And if it doesn't bounce, if it bounces back, then it will be sent by uh, first class mail instead. So that's, that's how we test them. Let me go for another question. The department service level agreement requires inspections to be scheduled and conducted within 15 business days of receipt. 15 business days is I think roughly equal to three weeks. How did the department arrive at this number? And if you didn't arrive at it, why do you stand by the number? In other words, if you inherited it, why do you stand by it? So this, uh, this version of our SLA dates from the earliest I could find was the fiscal year 20 performance plan for the Department of Consumer and Regulatory Affairs. And before that, the performance plans uh, talked about 30 days from when an inspection was resulted into a notice of violation or a uh, inspection report. So I wasn't there at the time the switch was made. I don't know the motivations, but the value of the current SLA is it is quick. My estimate, thinking about what the old one was, is that this is probably about twice as quick as the old one. But it is long enough that it allows us to schedule the, the regular violations and prioritize the emergency violation sooner. So we need that flexibility um, within our scheduling process. I have a few more questions, but Councilor Freeman, do you have any more? You had said uh, each inspector has no more than eight slots, which I assume means properties or units uh, per day. That's, Is that correct? That's correct. The schedule starts with at most the possibility of eight inspections. It might be less, but it's never, never more than eight inspections. What if it's all of the same property? 
Or that I... would be highly unlikely for a complaint-based inspection. I suppose it could happen. Okay. Um, does just because of practice and doing this, uh, is that how the department ensures that it's able to maintain that workload? That's correct. This is a, uh, you know, this workload is something that the program has looked at. We have adjusted it. I believe in the past it's been both higher and lower than where it is currently. So this is something that we do look at um, and that we do try to maintain in the most effective manner. The department's SOP for quality assurance and quality control says that managers must conduct weekly supervised and unsupervised quality assurance, but does not say what metrics or measures managers use to assess the quality of inspections. So how do managers assess the quality of inspections being conducted by housing code inspectors? What specifically do managers look for when conducting quality assurance reviews? The quality control process for the inspection starts even before the manager. So it starts with the application that the inspectors are using to document the inspection. That's going to give them guidance on you have to fill out, you know, this, that, and the other thing to advance. You can only cite this list of violations. You can't go anywhere else in the code. So that provides some level of quality control. Then the manager comes in. All of the NOIs that are finished off by the inspectors under the manager go to the manager who directly reviews them. And that's where they're looking for, you know, did they cite the correct violation? Did they choose the correct violation for this, uh, you know, whatever's in the picture? Did they take a picture? Did they take a picture that substantiates the violation? This is where they're looking for the quality. Can it be uh, sustained when it goes to OAH? And then after that, the Civil Infractions Office also looks at it, and they're looking for completeness on things like the service address, the contact information, um, all of those other technical things that the inspector can't be expected to know in the field. And only if, uh, only if it passes through both of those quality controls does it get served. And if it doesn't, here's another, this is another control. If the manager says, you didn't do it right, inspector, it gets denied then the inspector has three days to fix it. And there's another tool that the management team uses that tracks um, how many disapprovals each inspector has, and the management team uses that to guide training decisions. Part of your answer, if not much of it, seemed to be in real time when the inspector comes back and has a proposed NOI and the manager looks at it to see if it's and civil infractions looks at it to see if it passes muster. But my question was about weekly supervised and unsupervised quality assurance, I guess, meetings. Yes, so the managers do also sometimes conduct ride-alongs um, to make sure that our team's doing the right thing. I believe that's what the SOP is referring to. But they would be looking for the same same basic things. Are you following the right steps? Are you documenting the right things? Are you citing the right violations? Are you providing excellent customer service to the to the tenant if you're interacting with them, to the landlord if you're interacting with them? Um, how long does an inspector have before they're required to take the ICC exam? For our current position descriptions, they have one year. And this is a, 
uh, an innovation because it was hard to fill the positions when we were just trying to hire and say, you must have the IPMC. Well, we weren't finding a lot of people who had it. So the current version of that Housing Inspector 1 PD says, you got to have it or you got to get it within a year. That's the same length of time as the probation period. So if you don't have it in a year, the expectation is you would not be retained. The um, I don't know that we have uh, actually done that to anyone yet, in part because we made these changes to the PDs less than a year ago. So I don't think it has become uh, relevant at this point. Well, I was going to ask, my next question was, what happens if the inspector fails the ICC examination and cannot become certified? So if I remember correctly from your statement, you bring somebody in, unless they already have the certification, you bring them in as a specialist? That's correct. You can you can be a specialist with no certification. And what you're saying is that they have a year to get certified. Uh, no, if you're a specialist and you want to stay a specialist, you can probably stay a specialist forever. It's grade seven. It's... Uh, you know, it's pretty low. If you want to move up, then you're going to have to, and, and if you apply to move up to Housing Code Inspector 1, and you get that, then you will have to get the IPMC to remain there. And, and we have had people who have not been able to advance because they did not get the needed criteria to to advance, but they just remained in their whatever position they were currently. So I'm hired as a specialist. I want to advance. I become inspector one. I have one year from that to get the IMPC. I fail to get the IMPC. I can drop back to a specialist. But that hasn't happened yet because this is new. That scenario has not happened. And then there's Inspector 2 and Inspector 3, which is additional credentials. And I'm assuming it's the same thing. If they they don't seek to advance and they don't advance, if they seek to advance and they uh, fail the examination, that they would not advance. Yes. I'm figuring it out. Um, The department has some resources and some authority to abate violations on its own. I think uh, Councilmember uh, White might have touched on this. Uh, how frequently does the department do this for emergency violations? Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman, because it allows me. I have now found the exact number that I didn't have when Councilmember White asked. In fiscal year 23, uh, we did this 682 times. They were all emergency violations because that's the, the criteria we use is basically will fixing these keep a unit from being uninhabitable. And so that's always going to be emergency violations. Uh, would that be 682 properties or 682? violations, some of which are at the same property? Some of them would be at the same property. It's 682 violations. Um, what, if any, additional resources and authority do you need to abate these violations more frequently? As I uh, discussed with Councilmember White, authority is not the limitation, it's it's resources. And if you compare the uh, 30,000 total violations that we identified in fiscal year 23 to the 682 violations we were able to abate using this process, that gives a good picture of the magnitude of the shortfall.
I have an email. Um, there was a property where the inspector went out. Apparently there've been quite a number of complaints about the property. Um, so inspectors have been out multiple times. On January 10th, an inspector went out, left the property after completing an inspection of the laundry room, the elevator, bubble in the lobby ceiling, which I think means that the ceiling had a bubble or bulge, and cracks on the fifth floor ceiling. The inspector was able to cite the property for sitting water and three washing machines. However, the bubble in the lobby ceiling and the cracks in the fifth floor ceiling and the water damage on the fifth floor, the inspector said, we're gonna to have to wait until the water comes, actually comes through the ceiling and it collapses. Does that seem right to you? No, Chairman, that doesn't seem right. And if uh, you give me the property, I'm happy to look into that case and, and make sure that the team handled it correctly. Okay. And I try to stay off of social media, but uh, there was a tweet today. The Department of Buildings is doing a proactive inspection of our entire apartment building at 3003 Van Ness. However, Equity Residential refuses to provide staff to allow the inspector into units, even when the tenant has signed a permission for allowing a permission form allowing an inspection. How do you respond to that? That, uh, I, I dislike that. That is not good. And uh, obviously we try to get 100% access for uh, all of our proactive inspections. Um, we would not accept a, a landlord stymieing uh, that access. Um, so we'll we'll look into that three thousand three. Yeah, I'll give you both of these. Um, Thank you, Chairman. But so, does the does uh, landlord staff have to accompany the inspector on a proactive inspection? I do not believe there is current uh, currently a legal requirement for them to accompany us. That sounds like generally in practice that does happen they can accompany us yes i mean oftentimes when they are participating in good faith they want to be there they want to see you know what's being cited they want to explain if there's anything to explain and, and the like so they do participate sometimes all right i'll give you both of these after the hearing any other questions Uh, I don't have any more questions at the moment. Uh, I thank you for your testimony and thank uh, everyone uh, on your staff. So with that, uh, let me just say to close out this hearing, this has been an oversight hearing of the Committee of the Whole. The topic has been the district's housing code inspection process. Anyone who wishes to submit comments or who promised today to submit comments, he has two weeks to do so. That is, the record will remain open until 5 p.m. on Thursday, February 1st, 2024. The time is 4.53 p.m., and this hearing is adjourned. Thank you, Chairman.